What is up, everybody? Welcome to Pub Sports Radio and welcome to Stat Diggers for UFC 300. We have an absolutely stacked card that I cannot wait to break down. We got 13 fights here on paper. Like this has potential to honestly be one of the best, if not the best card of, of all time. I mean, look at the, the very first fight of the card. Davis and Figueredo, Cody Garbrandt, two uh, former champions. You got the main card, three title fights, the, the BMF title on the line, the strawweight championship on the line, and then the main event, the light heavyweight championship as well. Uh, I cannot wait for this card. I've had this card circled uh, for a very long time, was able to get my research done nice and early, and yeah, I'm ready to break it down here with Wheezy on a Sunday. Wheezy, what is up? You are back. You are back from uh, your, your your big trip. How was it? Man, that trip was awesome, Brady. I was out of the country for two weeks. Uh, my girlfriend and I started our trip five days in France, in Paris, France. We got to hang out. I got to meet my girlfriend, who I've been with for the last 17 years of my life, Brady. The very first time I got to meet her biological father. Uh, he lives in Paris, France. And this dude is cool as shit, Brady. Like, he's got so many stories from back in the day. He's been a music journalist for Rolling Stone Europe for the last 30 years of his life. This dude was roommates with Lemmy, the lead singer and, and bass player for the band Motorhead. He was also in Hawkwind back in the day. So he's got stories about Lemmy. This guy's best friend growing up uh, and, and, and as an adult as well is Mick Jagger's little brother, Chris. Right. He's met every blues musician, whoever, whoever was worth, uh, uh, you know, their their salt in music. Th this guy has some awesome stories. So we got to hang out with him. We had dinner with a couple of Sonny's other uh, uh, relatives out there. Then we went for Sonny's stepdad's wedding in Tuscany, Italy. We were staying in this beautiful uh, villa out there just outside of Pisa. In Italy, and I mean, I've been to, I've been to France now. I, I've been to Colombia. I've been to Greece. You know, there I've been to some beautiful places in the world. But my God, man, Italy was just absolutely next level in in terms of being a gorgeous country to visit. Uh, Pisa, amazing. We got to see the Leaning Tower there and, and the plaza where where they have the church, uh, which is which is even more incredible. There's a, there's a city called Luca right outside of Pisa that has walls surrounding it that are 20 feet high. And every building was built like three centuries ago. That Just the history in these places was incredible. The food, Brady, the food would make you cry. Oh, my God, the gelato, the pasta. I mean, and the pride that the Italians take in their food. They're beautiful people, too. They dress well. The women are gorgeous. And everybody's outside enjoying themselves. The beautiful scenery of Rome, Italy. Oh, my God, we saw the Colosseum. We went to the Vatican. Uh, there's only one gripe, right? Only one gripe. And here it is, Brady. And I have to say, this, this is going to piss a lot of people off, but I don't care because it's the <laughs> truth, okay? Chicago pizza is undefeated. It is so much better than Italian pizza. It is so much better than New York pizza. I mean, New Yorkers have this thing where they seem to think that they have the best pizza in the country or the world, and it's not even close in wow. terms of Chicago. Chicago's deep dish pizza is, is obviously the best in the world, and that's not, that's not debatable. But our thin crust pizza beats seven shades of shit out of New York and especially Italy, because New York is better than Italy. That's the only thing. It's so crazy that the Italians don't get right is pizza. And also, it would be tough for you over there, Brady, because like the showers in Italy, they were all created back when people were five foot one. <laughs> like as a six foot two dude in Italy, like you cannot even take a shower. Every shower is not even big enough for you to move around in. Like if you want to wash your pits, you need to like stand up oh, and like gosh. get like, I mean, like, dude, it's crazy. So like, those are the only gripes, but I want to be clear about two things. You know, Chicago has the best pizza in the world. New York is nowhere even close. <laughs> either. And no. yeah, and, and neither is Italy, you know, and, and second of all, the, the problem with, you know, being a big guy trying to move around Europe, like the car, the cars are small, the bathrooms are small. But other than that, man, 
It was absolutely incredible. So I am so energized. I am so ready after being away for two weeks and having a phenomenal vacation to come back to this UFC 300 card, the best card of the year. You look at the, these these fights, Brady. Every single one of these fights could headline any of these trash apex cards that the UFC puts out, you know, yeah. from Figueredo Garbrandt all the way up to the, to the, you know, co-main event, even nickel Brundage would ha- would headline some of these cards because Bo Nickel is such a big name. So uh, we're, we're really, we're really spoiled this week. This is what happens when the UFC tries and they tried really hard and they got the job done. These are phenomenal fights from top to bottom, and I can't wait to talk about them with you in the chat today. Yeah, I was I was going through the card. I'm like, man, this card is so good. I'm like, which which is my least favorite fight on the card? Which which fight on this card am I least looking forward to? And I literally couldn't pick one. I literally couldn't pick which fight I'm least looking forward to. So I, I couldn't. I don't. I don't have an answer. Like I'm looking forward to every single fight. So that's awesome. The UFC has has finally tried. They finally put together a very good card. And, and Wheezy, um, I've known you for four or five years, and I've, I've never been pissed off at you until until as of recent because you were smart. You left <laughs> the United States of America, got out of the country um, in, in this two-card stretch, and you didn't take me with you. So my bad bets, all the blame is going on you. You're the reason I did not cash the under two and a half in the Hernandez-Jackson fight. Mm. You're the reason I bet Bahamondas round two, round three instead of round one. And you are also the reason I bet um, on Melissa Mullins inside the distance. So a little upset with you, Easy, but it's okay. We'll move past it. Um, But what I will say, last night I hit my very first over two and a half rounds. It was my very first two and a half round bet over to the over of the year. And guess what fight it was on? Let me see. Uh, Um. Was it on GDR Norma? No, it was actually a pretty good line. I got it at minus one to thirty. Minus one thirty for an over on that card. Uh, was it the main event? No, that was, was like the, minus one seventy. No, it was uh, Morono McGee over two and a half. Cash it, man. I looked. I looked at that fight goes, man, because that fight goes was like, oh god, Court McGee's not finishing anybody, and since he refuses to wrestle. I kind of like that one going the distance, and I know that was one of the prop template liked with as many fights of Morono and McGee that went to decision. So I probably would have been uh, joining you on that bet had I been in the country and had I been gambling, but no bets last week. The week before that, I had two bets, but one of them got canceled because it was the Gatto money line. Yeah. So over the last two events, I have I had one bet for one unit, and it didn't cash because – it was a parlay that had the Ebo Aslan Turkali under one and a half. So yeah, I did nothing over these last two weeks, and Very I'm looking good. to come pull, come back for the best card you of the came year. Came back so. at, at, at the right time, man. You came back at the right time, but yeah, I didn't have much action last night. I was gonna actually fully skip with the card, but I did add some spots. I like, like I said, I like that under in the Jackson uh, Hernandez fight. That was close. Um, Hernandez did drop Jackson in early in the third, and then instead of going for the TKO, he went for the sub for some reason. Um, but yeah, there's some close bets, but I, I did end up missing most of those, but yeah, this last two card stretch for me has been pretty terrible. So I'm on a two event skid, but that's all going to turn around here for UFC 300. I'm liking some spots. I have some bets already and I'm sure we'll find some spots. Like it's, it's easy to find spots on fights that are actually good. Like, you know, GDR Dumont last week, I almost bet GDR, uh, plus 170. Ended up passing, and I I really thought she was going to win. You didn't you didn't watch that. You didn't watch any of the fights. I I barely watched um fights as well. But did you see that Dumont landed like no significant strikes and still won the fight? I want to see what the exact number was. She uh-huh. landed. Oh, they gave her eleven. They gave her eleven. Zero significant strikes in the first round, and three in the third, and she won a decision. Yeah, she she four and a half minutes of control time in round number three and. Three minutes and 50 seconds of control time in round number one. So, yeah, man, that was always Norma's uh, or that was always Jermaine's biggest problem. You know, she yeah. never had problems standing. It was always, you know, was somebody going to be able to take her down? And Norma's Norma's a load, man. You know, she's a big, powerful woman. So she was able to get those takedowns. But, yeah, 10 minutes of control time to two point to two minutes and 20 seconds for Jermaine's. But, yeah, sometimes under that new 
judging that we've been seeing, you know, it wouldn't have been that surprising to maybe see Jermaine get the nod, but I I got the flight attendant tenant got me so drunk, Brady, on the flight home yesterday. Dude, I had seven gin and tonics on the way home. It was a nine hour flight. So by the time I got home, like I was so drunk that I saw Falcao versus Hugo. And then I started laying back on the couch and my girlfriend's like, if you fall asleep, I'm changing the channel. I'm like, I'm not going to fall asleep. And then the next thing I know, I'm I'm out like a light. So I didn't even, I think I saw like some of the first round of that Dumont fight, but I missed the rest of it. Yeah, I missed them. I, I actually uh, took some of the card off to research for, for the UFC 300. And I wanted to watch the Campbell Peak fight, but I had to go pick up my son like right at, while that fight was going on. But I, I'm surprised that fight went went the distance. Um, 15 minutes between Peak and Campbell. Other than that, um, I saw a little bit of the main event. A lot of people thought that Chris Curtis won. It was a close fight. I think it could have went either way. But shout out to Chris Curtis for looking as good as he did coming in there on, what, a couple weeks notice? Yeah, and tearing his hamstring in the second round from what I heard. But yep. I didn't get to see right. a second of that fight. I wish I could commentate fight. on it. But, um, yeah, I didn't get to watch these fights. I Like, I, I fell asleep drunk at, like, 3.30 p.m. and woke up at, like, midnight. And I was like, oh, come on. This jet lag sucks, dude. But I'm going to try to get my sleep patterns back in order today and get, get back to work this week. Yeah, well, we got some great fights to talk about on this car, Weezy. No, no Norma Dumont on this car. No Cynthia Calvillo. They they can't do that to us on this card here. Um, so I do want to shout out the chat before we get started here. We have the first one in the building is Olajuwon, Dream. I uh, say, let's go. We got Dixon. And yeah, Dixon, what happened last night? The only fans fade when 0-3. Charlie Campbell, only fans got the win. Chepe Mariscal, debatable, but he got the win. And then Norma got the win. So I don't know, Dixon. Um, there, what, what, what's it called, Wheezy, whenever there's a, a trend and and it has to go back to like the mean? A regression. regression. That's regression. regression. Yeah, we saw the regression in the OnlyFans fade this week. But prior to that, man, it, it had been on it fire. Hot. It was hot. Very, I I very hot. I wish the trend stopped for the Algeo fight, but I guess it was—I guess it was—it uh, was this last night. I did not see that one coming, man. Especially when um, it finished. I think we do have some OnlyFans on this card, <laughs> Jessica Andrade. Uh, so it should be interesting, <laughs> interesting to talk about. AJ in the building, Victor De Jesus, Hector. We got Andrew G. We got Taylor saying uh, the ultimate hangover here. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely, right here. Uh, Rem Dog, Dustin Vallejos. We got Dylan. Uh, Augustine, KCOH, what is up, everybody? Thank you for hanging out. If you guys could smash the like button, subscribe here to Post Sports Radio. We go live every Sunday. Chance Cole, uh, Call of Duty as well. What is up, guys? Oh, gosh. Yeah, Curtis apparently walked out to Diddy. I didn't. That's I just didn't terrible. I, I don't know who the <laughs> hell would ever voluntarily walk out to that fool. I mean, all the other shit that we've been hearing about that guy lately completely out the window. You know, let's let's completely throw his personality out the window. The fact that this clown actually hires a dude to walk around and carry an umbrella over his head. All that out the window, Brady. Diddy's music always has and always will suck and that is an absolute fact we can disagree about chicago pizza we can disagree about what the most beautiful country in the world is but if you're walking out to diddy you're making a huge mistake and you got dog shit tasting music and that's that with there, there on this there could be no debate brady yeah diddy i would never listen to a diddy song i mean I, I can't even off the top of my head i can't even name one song to be honest well you shouldn't be able to i mean like otherwise yeah. you'd probably be completely brain dead and in jail if you were listening to that clown at this point yeah. in your life it's, exactly. it's about life decisions man and listening to diddy that is a horrible horrible <laughs> life decision it sure is it sure is <laughs> All right, but uh, speaking of a good life decision, the UFC made some good decisions on this card with this matchmaking, man, and we're kicking it off with an absolute banger. Like you said, this fight could potentially headline a, a shit Apex card. Like, it could have headlined the Absolutely. shit Apex card last night. Could have headlined uh, the shit Atlantic City card. This is a great fight card, or a fight here to start off the card. We got Davison Figueredo going against Cody Garbrandt. We got Davis and Figueredo, 36 years old, five foot five with a 68 inch reach. Cody Garbrandt, 32 years old, five foot eight with a 65 inch reach. 
We got Cody four years younger, three inch height advantage, and a three inch reach disadvantage. Biggie is uh, two two and one draw his last five fights. Draw against Moreno, a submission loss to Brandon Moreno, a decision win against Brandon Moreno, a knockout loss to Brandon Moreno, and then a decision win against Rob Font. As far as Cody Garbrandt, a knockout win against Brian Kelleher his last time out. Decision win against Trevin Jones. Knockout loss to Kai Car France. Decision loss to Rob Font. And then a knockout win against Rafael Asante. So me and you talked about this fight a little bit in the on, on Discord. And I kind of feel like this fight, you know, minute for minute, probably does play out fairly close. Like, um, you know, I feel like these guys can go strike for strike. I feel like it could be even kind of like a, lo a lower volume uh, type fight like most Cody Garbrandt fights are. It's just a big worry the big elephant in the room for Cody Garbrandt has and, and always has been that uh, the chin and Davison Figueredo he hits very hard he hit very hard at flyweight came up to bantamweight and he showed in the Rob Font fight that he does carry that power up a weight class hurting Rob Font on a couple different occasions in that fight but Rob Font great recoverability Cody Garbrandt I'm not so sure uh, one thing I did notice was I was going through the record of Cody Garbrandt and you know since that dominant Cruz win which it feels like it was yesterday since that you know, incredible performance. That was back in 2016. Since that, he only has three wins. Um, Rafael was Sunsau in a fight where not a ton was going on, and he only landed 19 strikes, got the the, the second left on the clock, uh, knockout one in the second. And then against Trevin Jones, I was actually at that fight. Everybody was booing. The fight was horrible. I was the only buddy, I was the only person in attendance cheering because I had Cody Garbrandt by decision. <laughs> and uh, I was like, everybody was booing. I was like, no, Cody, you're doing perfect. Don't get hit. Don't do anything. I'm loving this. Don't get hit in the face, please. And he went and won a decision, but only landed 26 strikes in 15 minutes. And then he goes out there and beats Brian Keller. So so Kelleher, Jones, and Asun his last three wins. If he beats Figgy, like, that's going to be his best win um, in a very long time since that Cruz win back in 2016. But, yeah, I, I feel like this fight could play out closely. But I don't know if I can trust the chin of Cody Garbrandt over 15. Like, Figgy's going to land at some point, and, and when he does, that could be lights out. So, Weezy, uh, what are your thoughts on this first fight of UFC 300? Yeah, you know, my thought was if Figgy doesn't sleep this dude, this fight is 50-50. So, it's a big if. You know, I kind of feel like if you're betting on that Figueredo side, right now with where the money line is, and that's with Figueredo is a minus 310 favorite. So this guy's over 75% implied to win this fight right now. But neither one of these guys, Brady, is much of a minute winner, right? I mean, if you look at those stats on the screen, the number I'm highlighting right now, 6.79 distant strike attempts per minute from, from Figueredo. That's 4.92 less than the divisional average. And here we've got 2.99 landed for Garbrandt on only 7.74 attempts. He's thrown 3.96 less than the divisional average. Figueredo's a little more accurate, and Garbrandt's a little bit more defensively responsible. But you know what? Cody Garbrandt's hard to find. This guy doesn't get hit a lot, plain and simple. Only 534 times in 14 fights. You know, he's absorbing less than four significant strikes per minute. And at distance, he's also absorbing less than four. So my thought is, is that this fight's going to be close because Davison's the more likely guy to wrestle. He attempts 3.71 takedowns per 15 minutes. Cody only attempts about 3.2. But if you're talking about which one of these guys has better takedown defense, it's Cody. I think Cody's the better wrestler, to be honest with you. And Cody keeps his fight standing over 90% of the time. So, I, you know, I kind of feel like this fight, if it goes to decision, I think Cody's going to be very live to win this fight. Um, if, it, if, if somebody gets a finish, it's probably Davison, because I think both guys are equally powerful. Cody's got serious power, as does Davison. And Cody's illustrated that power over and over again at 135 pounds while we've seen Davison's power really kind of just translate at 125. So yeah, man, minus 310 for Davison Figueredo. I think I'd rather bet him to win inside the distance because if I think if he doesn't get a finish here, it's going to be a serious nail biter holding a minus 310 money line ticket on uh, Garbrandt, or I mean, on, on Figueredo here, because I think that this fight's going to be very close uh, until somebody lands a big shot. And frankly, I think Cody's just as likely to be the one to land the big shot 
as Davison. So this is dog or pass for me right here. Yeah, and it's one I'm probably just staying away from because I'm picking Figgy by knockout, but he's already minus 310. Like, what is the knockout prop going to be? Minus 200 just about? I mean, it could be. I, yeah. I mean, he's not really going to be um, much of a submission threat as Cody's never been submitted in his entire career. Um, yeah. But, and, and frankly, I don't even think he's getting Cody to the ground. No, he's I mean, not. Cody, I don't think so. Cody's only been controlled 3.53% of his UFC career, but he's not seen a lot of takedown attempts either. So, I mean, frankly, if Davison does wrestle a lot, you know, he might have some success here because Cody just hasn't seen that kind of a game plan much at this level. But I think the reason that we don't see a lot of takedown attempts against Cody is because the dude has excellent footwork and he's really hard to find out there, whether it's with your striking or if you're trying to track this dude down, you get a little bit reckless. You come in a little bit uh, with your hands down and your chin up. Cody can absolutely catch you. So, yeah, man, I think that this is a nice dog or pass opportunity here. I think Cody has looked really good in his last two fights. But like you said, Brady, going from Trevin Jones and Brian Kelleher to Davis and Figueredo is a big step up in competition. And that's, I think, why. People like Figueredo here. I think he's got a lot of the finishing equity in this fight due to how not durable Cody's been. And I also think that Davison's been fighting the tougher guys recently. He's got a win over Font while Garbrandt lost to Font. So, yeah, there, I think that Davison's definitely the rightful favorite here. But minus 310, ooh, that's, that's steep. Yeah, it, it surprised me. Uh, KO is probably minus 110. I mean, if it's minus 110, I'm playing that. I mean, I, I'd probably bet a pillow minus 110 to knock out Cody Garbrandt. So if you're giving me Figgy at minus 110 by knockout, that that, that works. Uh, Figgy will mix in takedowns here. Maybe he, try, maybe he tries, but Cody Garbrandt's take to defense is, is pretty elite there. Uh, Cody no chin finished, unfortunately. Uh, MMA Jesus liking the no live by, by KO. Uh, Garbrandt is washed. He gets his ass shaved again here. Figgy is uh, Call of Duty's lock of the week. Uh, and this is kind of how I'm seeing it. Um, Doze yeah. or Dio's. Uh, it's all going to look great for Cody, and then he'll be on the floor. What, what do you think about maybe like a decision only for Cody? Yeah, because at, at, as an underdog, I think that that's probably the best way. I mean, if you look at um, Figueredo, four, one, and one in decisions in the UFC, and Cody's three and one. So both of these guys are pretty good minute winners, but both of these guys are counter strikers, Brady. So two low volume counter strikers, maybe the way to play this fight is the over one and a half. It's better than minus 200 right now. And really, I think you're just worrying about whether Cody gets caught early or not, but Cody's really good defensively. You know, so uh, I think that would be the way to play this fight right now is maybe go over one and a half uh, because it's going to be it's going to be a minute before Davison lands a big shot, I think. No, I actually agree. Um, it could be like the sweatiest over of your life or it could be like the least sweatiest because these guys just might not do anything. I mean, this could be such a you look at Cody Garbrandt's last several fights. Nothing happens, really. I mean, yeah. obviously, he knocked out Keller, but before that, nothing happened in the Jones fight. Nothing. The entire fight, um, the Asuncao fight, nothing happened. So, yeah, I don't hate like the over. Um, it's uh, minus one eighty five. The under one and a half is plus one fifty five. And then, like you said, Davison minus three ten. Garbrandt plus two sixty. I'll see what they what they do put Davison by knockout out, but I'm not expecting a, a solid price there. Yeah, I know. I think that that's probably going to be a nice juiced line there, Cody by or I mean Davison by KO. But you know. Cody's been knocked out four times in the UFC. He's been dropped uh, seven. So, yeah. you know, that's the, but Cody knows that too. He you does. know, it's not like Cody doesn't know that he, he needs to protect that chin, maybe wrestle a little bit more and, and really continue to use that footwork and elusiveness that really has been a, you know, a, 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 um, a trademark of the way that he's fought over his entire UFC career. We got Steve with the, with the oi, with the oi. Uh, why did they make a second figgy benefit? I don't know, but they shouldn't have. They they definitely shouldn't have. I went back and watched that fight. Uh, yeah, the yesterday or the day before it was it was kind of tough to watch. Figgy destroyed Benavidez. All right, let's move on to the next fight. Wheezy, we have Bobby Green. <laughs> I just saw that. How did I just see this? Bobby Green versus Jim Fucking Miller. Yeah, that's right. I love it. Every time, by the way, every time I break down the fight now in my head, I hear I hear fucking Miller. Yeah, I know. 
such a I great name on, for such a great fighter. I love it. I almost said on my breakdown today because it just it's stuck in my head at this point. Uh, did he officially change his nickname to, to fucking, by the way? Yeah, like he's saying it. I think he's even tweeting it. You know, he was A-10 for his entire career. And he's like, God damn it. It's UFC 300. I've had 29 <laughs> UFC fights since the year 2013. I'm Jim fucking Miller. And everybody <laughs> is going to call me that because they know I deserve that respect. If anybody deserves it, it's him. It's damn him. right. Heck yeah. Who, All right. but who else but Jim Miller? I mean, Jim fucking Miller. Let's go. UFC like 100, UFC 200, and here he is at UFC 300, Brady. He's he's blessing us with his presence, and he's an absolute legend. Yeah. Only only Jim Miller can pull something that like that off. Like, imagine Alexander Hernandez trying to change his <laughs> nickname to fuck it. Like, Alexander fucking her. And it, just doesn't, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. It, it's, <laughs> oh, it's Jim Miller. And that's it. Uh, we got Jim Miller versus Bobby Green. We got Bobby Green, 37 years old, five foot ten with a 71 inch reach. Jim Miller, he's 40 years old, five foot eight with a 71 inch reach. Bobby Green, he is 2 2 in uh, one no contest in his last five fights. Knockout loss to Drew Dober. No contest against Jared Gordon. A submission win against Tony Ferguson. Knockout win against Grant Dawson. Then a knockout loss against Jalen Turner. As far as Jim Miller, he is uh, four and one in his last five fights. You had a uh, knockout win against Nicholas Moda, submission win against Donald Cerrone, a uh, decision loss to Alexander Hernandez, a knockout win against Jesse Butler, and then a submission win against Gabriel Benitez. So this is a tough fight to call, in my opinion. So one thing we have to absolutely talk about is the fact that Bobby Green suffered what I think is probably the, one of the worst stoppages in, in UFC history against Jalen Turner. Like, there's been a ton of trash stoppages, but... But I think that one is like up there. It was I think it was Kerry Hatley was the ref. Jalen Turner wobbles Green very badly, floors him. The fight probably should have been stopped right there. But no, Kerry Hatley says, let us let me see some more, Jalen Turner. And then Jalen Turner lets off. It had to have been like 20 to 30 unnecessary shots, you know, vicious. And you know, we know how much power Jalen Turner has. Vicious, ground and pound. And then after that, uh, Bobby Green goes out again. He's out, and then there's another additional, like, five to ten just nasty strikes. It's like, Kerry Hatley should have been arrested for that. I mean, that was one of the worst stoppages I've ever seen. Kerry Hatley should be in, in jail right now for attempted murder. I mean, that was horrible. So Bobby Green is coming off of one of the worst stoppages I've ever seen, and that fight wasn't too long ago. I think it was, like, late late uh, last year, like December. So I worry about that. You know, Bobby Green, he's 37 years old at this point, which he's the younger guy, but he took a ton of damage in the Turner fight, got knocked out brutally by Drew Dober. He has that hands-down style. I kind of feel like at this point, you know, Jim Miller is the more durable guy. He's uh, So I don't know. I, I feel like Bobby Green is, is on absolutely the better striker. I like the, the volume that he brings to the table. I like that hands-down style, but Jim Miller can crack. He's showing a lot of power. I don't know, Weezy. It's it's a tough one for me to pick here. Uh, which way are you lean into this one here? Yeah, you know, this is one of those fights where it's like, okay, if this fight goes to decision, Bobby Green's the better minute winner, especially yeah. at distance striking range. I mean, come on, man. I mean, Bobby Green spends 75% of his UFC cage time at distance striking range. And when Brady, he lands 2.3 more significant strikes per minute than his opponents do. Um he throws 13.78 distance strike attempts per minute. He lands 6.7, and he's got such great head movement, and he's so fast. that uh, and, he's, and he's very accurate, too. I mean, you look at that 48% accuracy at distance, the 64% distance striking defense, which is excellent. He has been knocked down five times, but that's in 24 UFC fights, you know? So... And, and it's and for Miller, yeah, he's got some knockdowns. He's got like a, a three knockdowns in 29 fights. And we saw him absolutely brutally starch Jesse Butler, brutally starch Nick Moda. Um, even uh, Ghost Pepper uh, Gonzalez, he 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 destroyed that dude too. But you know, these are much lower level guys than than who he's gonna be fighting this time around in Bobby Green, a guy that's been out there against Jalen Turner, Grant Dawson. Jared Gordon, Drew Dober, Tony Ferguson, his last five fights, you know, definitely fighting a higher level of competition than Jim has more recently. But Jim's hot. He's won like five of his last six fights. You know, I mean, he might it might have been over the rotting corpse of Donald Cerrone and Ghost Pepper Gonzalez. But this guy's going out there and he's very aggressive. 
and Miller's a finisher and, and green is a minute winner. So, you know, Jim's going to have to find that minute, you know, he's gonna have to find, I'm sorry, find that moment, land a big shot on the feet, get a takedown, find the back in a scramble, something he's going to have to really bring some chaos here because if he, if he kind of just, Fights Green's fight here. He's going to get picked apart, plain and simple. Uh, he's gonna. He doesn't throw enough volume, and he doesn't land with enough power on the feet to worry about like guys like Dober stopping Green. You know, guys like Jalen Turner, who has a one hundred percent finish rate as a pro. Those guys are going to stop you. But Miller kind of needs to either be much better on the feet than his opponents, in which case he's not here, or. He needs to kind of find that moment in the grappling exchanges because this guy only gets 1.31 takedowns per 15 minutes. And Bobby Green's extremely difficult to take down, and he's an excellent wrestler in his own right. So I think Jim Miller, I think somebody said it in the chat, uh, the uh, Jim uh, Jim Miller finish only prop. Because he's an underdog in this fight, You know, I think that Miller finish only is a good look this week, as is Bobby Green by decision, because... Jim fucking Miller is a very durable dude, and he's difficult to finish unless you're, you know, a top-notch UFC talent. And Green's not known as this massive finisher. He's got five finish wins and in, in 12 UFC wins. So, yeah, man, I think it's either Bobby Green by decision or Jim Miller finds a moment somewhere here. But I think the pick for me is going to be Green by decision. I don't love this fight for Miller because Green should be able to keep it standing. Yeah. Um, seeing it the exact same way, I just I kind of landed on the other side in terms of picking Miller to find that big moment. I worry about the durability of Bobby Green at this point. Uh, but yeah, you're right. I mean, if this goes to decision, it should be Bobby Green cruising, right? Just pr- pretty much easily winning the fight. It's just I feel like Jim Miller is going to make it a dog fight and land a big shot. I mean, that hands down style of Bobby Green's it's it's fun to watch. It's cool to watch, and it works a lot. It's just you know. You know, if, if Jim Miller hits you clean, I could see him going down. So I'll be looking at this Jim Miller finish only. If it's if it's mm-hmm. plus money, I'll be on that as well. And then we'll see what the Bobby Green by decision is as well. I think those are the two best outcomes there. The last Bobby Green fight is a turning point like Tony Ferguson. Come on, I want to go. I want to go that far. But uh, he won't completely be washed, but his speed and timing won't be as sharp. And that's his whole game. Yeah, I mean, Bobby Green, he kind of looked off against Jared Gordon in that no contest. He was getting picked apart by Jared Gordon. I didn't like seeing that. And even in the Ferguson fight, Ferguson hurt him in the first round. So I think we might be seeing, starting to see like a decline of Bobby Green, not to Tony Ferguson territory, not even close yet. But yeah. uh, we might we might start seeing it soon, especially after uh, Kerry Hatley almost killed him the other the other card or the other uh, fight. Uh, we got TJ saying, "Let's go! This is the best UFC card ever on paper. It has certainly potential to be to be so." Um, can anyone name one good ref and one good judge? Um, a good ref. I can't, I know people hate him. I like Mike Beltron. Maybe it's the the long beard. I like Mike Beltron. And then obviously uh, everybody's favorite would be would be Herzog. Do you, can you name a good ref and, and good judge, Weezy? Yeah, uh, Herzog. Herzog's a good ref. Um, I think there's a couple guys that are a little bit underrated that don't ref as much. But uh, I think Tyone's actually pretty good. You know, <laughs> uh, there's there's a lot of guys who have made mistakes and they've looked yeah. really bad when they've made mistakes. Tyone. Was the one who who stopped that? Uh, that he's made that a lot first... of mistakes, yeah. But I like yeah. him too. Yeah, I mean, I think like he actually gets it right a lot of the time. Um, and as far as judges go, I mean, I just know that I hate Ron McCarthy. He's uh-huh. like my least favorite judge. Um, but there's a lot of guys I think that even Sal D'Amato has been a lot better lately than he was like a year and a half ago. I think he's gotten some better scorecards lately. But yeah, man, it's tough, dude, because. You know, a lot of these fights wind up being close, and then these judges are put under a lot of scrutiny in these close fights, and we're seeing a shift in the way the judging's being uh, done. They're really, really worried about damage, and they're not scoring control. So uh, it's 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 a weird time for for uh, MMA judging. It's weird. It's it's very weird time. Uh, green decision. I think that's very much on the table. Jim Miller finish only. Yeah, if it, we'll see what the price is on that. Uh, who predicted the Dawson KO? Um, I, I know Not some people me. that I know some people that predicted like green late knockout, like like four or five type knockout, but nobody predicted a green 30 second knockout. That's that's for sure. Um, this is going to look like the Chepe Mariscal uh Sharia ends in split. Did not get to see that fight, but heard it was uh, maybe a controversial decision. Um, Dixon, by the way, does does anybody any, any one of these guys have an OnlyFans? Bobby Green or, or Jim Miller? 
I don't know. Jim Miller should have an OnlyFans where he's just fucking. <laughs> That's all he's doing. It's just, just fucking everything. <laughs> Oh, uh, people are forgetting all the splits Bobby's been in. I st- yeah, I mean, Bobby Green's always hard to trust. I mean, he's he's lost a lot of fights that he should have won. Um, the fight IQ is not all there. I don't know if Bobby's chin will still be good. Uh, Kim Winslow. Yeah, bring back Kim Winslow. Bring her Let's back. Go. Gary Copeland should oh. should never ref a fight ever again. Uh, Tony loves the early style. That's why, that's why I love Tyone. Like, if you're, if you're betting an under, Weezy, and you see yeah. Chris Tyone in there, you you get excited, you know for sure you're hitting that ticket. If you see Keith Peterson in there, you rip up that ticket right away. That's that fight's going over. Yep, yep, yep. No nonsense is the goat. Um, he's starting to grow on me a little bit, Keith Peterson. But we we've given him so much shit in the past, Peterson. We have. Uh, I would still love to drink with that dude, man. I would love to drink with that dude. Maybe smoke a cigarette with him as well. Yeah, yeah, I would. Be, I, I don't want to smoke with cigarettes anymore in my life, Brady. But I would definitely smoke with cigarettes if I was at an event and Keith Peterson offered me one. I'd be like, "Yeah, man, give me that." Yeah, I don't smoke, but I mean, if, Peter, if Peterson offers you one, you gotta. It'd be disrespectful not to smoke a cigarette with him. So, all right. Speaking of OnlyFans, we have our first OnlyFans of the week, and I I know this for a fact because I unfortunately came across the pictures, and I am still scarred uh, till this day. Still wake up in the night in cold sweats, um, you know, seeing these these images. But we got Jessica Andrade going against Marina Rodriguez. We got Jessica Andrade, 32 years old, five foot one with a 62 inch reach. Marina Rodriguez, 36 years old, five foot six with a 65 inch reach. We got uh, Andrade, four years younger. Rodriguez with a five inch height advantage and a three inch reach advantage. Andrade is uh, two and three her last five fights. A decision win against Lauren Murphy. A submission loss to Aaron Blanchfield. Knockout loss to Yan Zhao Nan, submission loss to Tatiana Suarez, and then a knockout win against Mackenzie Dern. Uh, as far as Marina Rodriguez, she is three and two her last five fights. Decision win against Mackenzie Dern, a uh, decision win against Yan Zhao Nan, knockout loss to Amanda Lemos, a decision loss to the very handsome uh, Verna Janaroba, and then a knockout win against Michelle Watterson Gomez. So this fight's uh, a very good fight. I think it's honestly one of the better fights of the entire card, uh, believe it or not, in my opinion. I think these two are just going to to swing dicks, and I think it's going to come down to who has the bigger dick in this matchup. Um, one thing I find interesting, though, you know, Andrade, before her last fight against Dern, like, people were completely writing her off, including me. I was like, I think Andrade is probably towards the end of her career. She looks completely disinterested. She's looked horrible in these last three fights. You know, uh, multiple losses all inside the distance. Then she goes out there and beats Mackenzie Dern, and she looks incredible. But we got to keep in mind, like, this matchup couldn't be any different. Um, I think these two are going to strike. Uh, both of these fighters have a lot of power. Both have great striking. Initially, I thought maybe Andrade can come out here and mix in some takedowns. Uh, Cause that's what Rodriguez has and always, you know, will struggle with, but you know, Andrade only landed three takedowns or last 10 fights. So I think we get a, a striking fight here. I kind of like the under just with the, how I see this fight playing out. Jessica Andrade, very defensively irresponsible. Um, she's been finished like nine times in her career. And then on top of that, Andrade can finish most people in the division. So I think a plus money under solid. Um, but Weezy, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this fight here. Am, am, am I uh, too excited about this? Maybe it's Andrade that I'm too excited about. But are you as excited as me here? It's a Jessica Andrade fight. She always brings it. She's a super exciting fight to, to fighter to watch. And uh, I think everybody, whether they have money on her or against her in any particular spot, they've got a ton of respect for Jessica Andrade. I mean, she's just earned that respect over her entire UFC career. She's fought at 135, at 125, at 115. She's fought for championships. She's been champion. Uh, She's fought literally the best women that the division really has to offer. You look at that strength of schedule, Brady, over 26 UFC fights, and the combined record of her opponents, 198 wins and 124 losses. So she's fighting on average Ladies with 12.38 UFC fights and the average record of the girl that she's fighting, 7.62 wins, 4.77 losses. So, I mean, she's always been in there against the division's best, whether she's fighting at 135, 125, or 115. But really with Jessica, I find it kind of hard to cap her fights right now because she's lost three out of her last four, you know, and... 
those three fights that she lost, even though they were against top-notch competition, Aaron Blanchfield, up a weight class on short notice. Yan Zhao Nan, again, on short notice. And then Tatiana Suarez on short notice. So, But it looked like she had checked out. She just didn't look like she was in those fights to win them, you know? And then she comes back against Mackenzie Dern as an underdog, and she looks fantastic. She looks ready. She she has a full camp for that fight. She's ready to fight, and she gets a second-round knockout. And now here we are against Marina Rodriguez, and this is a winnable fight for Jessica. But she's going to have to really be aggressive here because she can't just sit at range against Marina Rodriguez. Marina's too dangerous. She's too uh, accurate out there. She's got too much power, and she's just too clean of a striker. 66% distance striking defense, uh, 40% accuracy, a positive 2.13 distance striking differential. So Marina's got excellent Muay Thai. She's got great distance management. And she knows how to win minutes against great strikers, even like Yan Zhao Nan. That was a very close fight, but Yan's got elite minute-winning ability at distant striking range, and Marina was able to out-minute uh, Yan by landing the bigger shots, especially at the, at the end of rounds. She seems to be acutely aware of when she needs to turn it up and be more aggressive and, and win the right minutes in a round in order to bank that round. You know, Jessica's a pretty good minute winner, Brady. She's seven and two in decisions in the UFC. And Marina, she's five, two, and two. So, but what, what we've seen from Marina is, is that you can win minutes against her if you take her down. You look over here, these four numbers all green for Jessica. She gets 24% control time, only allows 10%. She has less than half of the total takedowns. Uh, attempts in her fights, but she gets over 70% of the control time. With Marina, she's only got two takedowns and she's allowed 20. She gets 6.5% control time. She allows 32%. So there's definitely going to be chances for um, Jessica to mix in that wrestling and win some minutes with that wrestling. And at range, it's actually Jessica who has the, the uh, more of the power strikes here as she has landed... Uh, it looks like about six knockdowns in 26 fights. She has six UFC wins by way of knockout. And she throws a lot more volume at range, 15.41 compared to 12.42 for Marina. And she's landing seven significant strikes per minute at distance compared to just under five for Marina. So when we look at the numbers here, we see an opening for Jessica to win minutes in the grappling exchanges. But even at range, it looks like Jessica might have a little bit more power and she's landing more strikes than, than her opponents do and she throws a lot more volume at distance than Marina. I just think it's going to come down to the, the way that Jessica fights here. Is she going to be very aggressive? I think if she's very aggressive, she's going to close that range on Marina, make this a dirty fight where she can win some minutes in the clinch potentially, even though Marina's excellent in the clinch and uh, potentially get this fight to the ground. Uh, Jessica's fought the better brand of competition. She's been a former champion. Uh, so I think there's a lot of reasons to like Jessica here, but you do have to worry about the fact is, is she showing up for a check here because she's done that a few times recently. Uh, and we have to, you know, I think one of the things that we can't cap is where is Jessica mentally for this fight? She's the younger fighter. She's the more powerful fighter. She's fought the better brand of competition. But if she doesn't fight smart here, she might get picked at part at range for three rounds by Marina Rodriguez. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good question there. It's like it was just, you know, one fight ago, everybody was like, Jessica Andrade is a bum now. And now all of a sudden she goes out there and knocks out dirt and she's back. Is she back or did she fight Mackenzie Dern, who has the worst striking imaginable? I don't I don't know. But, yeah, she's going to fight aggressive. I mean, uh, Jessica Andrade has had 26 UFC fights. She's fought aggressive in 25 of those. The one where I, I remember her not fighting aggressive was that Tatiana Suarez fight where she just didn't show up at all. But other than that, she is you know pretty aggressive. Anthony's saying, I'm here to let you know that Connecticut pizza shits on Chicago. What? Yeah, well, I mean, Connecticut pizza, you know, absolutely worldwide famous, you know, 
for being fucking terrible. <laughs> and I'm like, come on, man. Connecticut pizza, you're going to compare Connecticut pizza to Chicago. Anthony, come to Chicago sometime. I- I'll-, I'll seriously take you on a pizza tour of this city that will blow your mind. Connecticut, no, man. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> the answer is no. Uh, she was taking fights to pay. Yeah, yeah. Mackenzie Dern was. Uh, that's just how bad Dern was. Um, Andrage gets my money. Andrage can't have more than 20. I think she shut the OnlyFans down. I'm pretty sure she she shut it down. I think she I mean. did. Yeah, I think she did. And and that's probably a good thing. That is a, a very good thing. But um, yeah, I mean, if, if I knew Andrage would come out here and wrestle for 15 minutes, I would be betting her here. It's just the last time she got more than two takedowns was back in uh, 2018 versus versus Tisha Torres, where she got 10. Like, if she came out there like she did against Torres and, and attempts uh, 12 takedowns, I'm, I'm probably max betting her here. It's just she hasn't showed the ability to wrestle or, or want to wrestle in just a very long time. Like, that Torres fight was, like, like 12 fights ago at this point. So I think it's a close fight. Uh, but what I what I don't hate is violence. Just with the way these two fight, especially Andrade, Andrade, a lot of her fights uh, do finish. She's been finished nine times. Uh, yeah, nine times, five by knockout, four by sub, and she also has a 72% finish rate in her own right. And Rodriguez has been knocked out before by Amanda Lemos. So I think the under at plus money is kind of where I'm, I'm liking the most on this fight. Um, and then we have Jessica Andrade minus 135, Rodriguez plus 115. Um, <laughs> have you been? Check out Dave Portnoy. New Haven pizza is legendary. I, I haven't had, have you? Well, actually, I, I got to be fair. You know, I've never been to Connecticut in my life. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> you know, so, you know, I, I, I honestly wouldn't know, you know, but, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like deep dish pizza. They think it's it's a terrible, you know, but that's that's not everything that Chicago has to offer. Chicago's got incredible thin crust pizza too. places like Lou Malnati's places like Pequod's that are known for their deep dish pizza. Dude, their thin crust pizza is incredible too. So uh, mm-hmm. Chicago has got a phenomenal pizza. Like they're very well rounded when it comes to the pizza. The, the deep dish is the best in the country because it was invented here. And outside of that, though, I mean, like there's some taverns in Chicago that are very not very well known that put out incredible thin crust pizza. So yeah, I'll put it up against any 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 place in the world, but it it, it destroys Italy. I'm telling you, dude, it absolutely destroys Italy. I had pizza in three different places in Italy trying to find good stuff. And yeah, and I was just like, man, it's not even close to Chicago. Uh, yeah, we you should come out with it like an Uncle Weezy pizza tour. Yeah, dude, I, I should do a vlog or something like that and take people to fucking Barnaby's, take people to Pequod's, take people to where I used to work over at Lou Malnati's, uh, Gino's East, Uno's, Dues. I mean, I'm telling you, man. This city is is incredible for pizza. There we go. You heard it here first. Uh, but speaking of incredible, Wheezy, it's it's this fight. I mean, this this is probably one of my favorite fights on the entire card for UFC 300, and it is uh, on the on the on the prelims here. We got Jalen Turner going against Hoynato Moicano. We got Jalen Turner, 28 years old, five, uh, six foot three with a 77 inch reach. Moicano, 34 years old, five foot 11 with a 72 inch reach. We got Jalen Turner, uh, six years younger. Jalen Turner with a four-inch height advantage and a five-inch reach advantage. Jalen Turner is uh, three and two. His last five fights, knockout win against Jamie Malarkey, a submission win against Brad Riddell, decision loss to uh, Mateus Gamrod and Dan Hooker, and then a knockout win against Bobby Green. As far as Honata Moicano, four and one in his last five fights, submission win against Jai Herbert, Alexander Hernandez, a decision loss to RDA, a submission win against Brad Riddell, and then a decision win against Drew Dober. And yeah, I cannot wait for this fight. Um, I think it's kind of a tough match for Moicano, though. Like Jalen Turner, first and foremost, this is a guy that's going to be six years younger. He's six foot three at lightweight, which I still don't understand how he makes weight. He's made weight in every single fight other than the, the Dan Hooker fight. And yeah, I think Moicano, the, the path would be to try to get this fight down to the mat by any means necessary. And I think that's going to be easier said than done. Jalen Turner's defensive wrestling is pretty good. It's improved. Like that Gamrot fight, it's a fight that he lost, but I mean, if, if we're doing the whole damage over control thing, I mean, he he clearly beat Gamrot because he's the only person that did any damage in that fight. He hurt Gamrot pretty much every single time he touched him, whereas Gamrot got some control. I mean, that's a terrible decision, especially looking back at it now where it's like judges are heavily favoring damage. Uh, that's a that's a trash decision there. And then the Dan Hooker 
loss. I was there live. He landed a head kick on Dan Hooker that would knock out 95% of the division. I'm not sure how Dan Hooker ate it. Was it was it the blonde hair? Was it the, the new tattoos? But he ate that head kick, whereas I don't know if Moicano is. So Moicano is a guy that incredible Brazilian jiu-jitsu, BJJ black belt. Um, if he can get the fight down to the mat, he can make things interesting. But on the feet, I worry about him. Like Jalen Turner is a dude that just has the death touch. When, when he lands on guys, they get hurt. They go down 100% finish rate. So, yeah, I think it's kind of a rough matchup for Moicano, hence the line. I'm kind of liking Turner here to not only win this fight, but but win it by knockout. And I think early on as well. Uh, Wheezy, I think these two are, are going to probably swing dicks. And I think it's going to come down to who has the bigger dick in this one. Yeah, and uh, you know, I mean, at six foot three with a seventy-seven inch reach and being a black man, I'm going with Jalen <laughs> Turner. Um, but you know, but you and I both know Brady that like, if this fight gets taken to the ground, Hanato Moicano is an absolute assassin down there, and so that's what Jalen has to worry about. I mean, we've seen Jalen lose a lot of minutes on the ground, plain and simple. I mean, again, the Gamrot fight, he lost that fight because he got taken down over and over again. Um, and Dan, I mean, and the, the other thing that's frustrating about uh, Turner is, God, he's 0-4 in decisions in his career. He's never won a decision. And, dude, he should be the kind of fighter who can win minutes as well as moments. With that length, with that size, um, and, and it being so difficult to take down taller guys and hold them down, he should be absolutely be able to pick dudes apart from distance and even mix in his own takedowns. Um, but he just always finds the finish. He always finds the finish. And when he doesn't, it's like, even when he, he looks like he should have won, like I thought he won that Gamrot fight. The, the hooker fight was very close. They, that Those could have went either way, both of them. So, and Moicano, uh, eight, one in one in decisions in his career. And I think Moicano doesn't get enough credit for how good his striking is. It's just that he's been willing to strike in situations where he should not have been willing to strike. Hanato needs to grapple in certain situations. And this, of course, is one of them. I mean, the guy's four inches taller than him. He's got a five-inch reach advantage. The guy's a southpaw. He's got serious, serious power. Um, You know, th this is not a guy that you want to mess around with at distant striking range. So Hanato has got to find a way to get into the clinch here. And when he gets into that clinch, he's going to need to find trips because you're not taking down uh, big guys like Jalen Turner on single legs. They can always just balance and hop around and find the base. And, you know, Hanato is not a blast double type of wrestler either. He's a guy who does do very well with his body lock trips and sweeps and reaps. And that's how he gets fights to the ground. And when you use those type of takedowns to get fights to the ground, Brady, it's a little bit easier to keep them there because they hit the ground with some impact. And you can usually pass to a dominant position like half guard if you're able to get those take those judo type takedowns that Moicano is very good at. So we see a guy like Moicano getting his takedowns at a 47% clip. He out controls his opponents 18% to 12% winning about 60% of the control time positions in his fights, but he's attempting 0 0.64 submissions per, per uh, 15 minutes. And uh, he uh, is six and one to the submission in the UFC and 10 and one to the submission as a professional. So um, a guy like Turner, who's 10 and uh, three to the KO as a pro, and most of those knockout losses came early in his career. Um, I just think that Jalen's going to do the way better work at distance. And because Moicano is not a guy that we can count on to wrestle aggressively. I like Jalen here. Um, I think he's going to get a knockout. You know, Moicano's chin has been cracked quite a few times. So uh, I think that Jalen's definitely live to get the finish here, but I always worry about if he doesn't get the finish, the judges just don't seem to like this guy. And I don't know why they don't like damage. The judges don't like, because he does a ton of it, a ton of it, yeah, <laughs> you know, and like, does. and most of the guys that are trying to beat him are just crotch sniffing anyway. So it's like, I don't get how he's not getting the nod here, but still, uh, Jalen is, is a problem. He's a serious problem. And this is not a great matchup for Moicano, but man, as soon as that guy gets you to the ground, 
he starts working towards the back and he can just absolutely suffocate you and win minutes in any round that he gets a takedown. He's definitely a threat to win minutes and absolutely a threat to win moments if he gets to your back and finishes with that rear naked choke. And I think he's got 10 of them on his record as a pro. So, yeah, man, we know what happens if Hinato gets you down, but getting a six foot three guy with a 77 inch reach trying to close the distance against a fighter like that in the big cage, it's going to be a tough road to hoe uh, for, for, for Hinato Moicano this time around. Yeah, I think so as well. Um, Hanata Moicano by points might have some value on it. Yeah, like Weezy said, Turner has never won a decision. 0-4, right? 0-4? 0-4 is a pro. It's it's so surprising to me. But, you know, it's just the it's way it is. This guy is such a dominant finisher that, you know, he can find ways to finish fights with submissions and with KOs. So uh, that was probably how he's going to get it done here, as we've seen Moicano finished in four of his five UFC losses. What's up, Joel? How you doing? Uh, I would lean Turner. Um, his reach has to give opponents night. Yeah, I mean, a six foot three lightweight. You don't see that uh, too often. Um, Tarantula by TKO. Uh, let's see. Hopefully the rep notices the knockout this time. Hopefully Kerry Hatley is, is nowhere near this fight or, or any fight for that matter. I mean, Kerry Hatley, one of the worst stoppages I've ever seen. Uh. I think Dober hits harder than Turner. I don't think I don't think so. I mean, Turner, like it looks like he barely touches guys and they wobble. I mean, Turner's powers is no joke. But yeah, Dober has a ton of power too. That that's for sure. Yeah. Um, this is screaming everybody parlaying Jalen inside the distance or ends inside the distance, but it goes to decision. And if it does, Jalen Turner probably doesn't look minus two sixty. I see a split decision. Uh, Joel says, I love me some Moicano, love him, but I, I don't see him winning. Uh, let's see. Moicano wants money. Yes. And hopefully he does not fall in love with the box. Remember that quote, Wheezy? From yeah. It's amazing. Uh, one of my favorites, because I mean, I bet on Moicano versus Fizayev. And I remember just screaming, wrestle for the love of God, <laughs> wrestle this guy, you know? And yeah, he did it a few times, but you know what happened, Brady? What's that? He won that fight against Calvin Cater. He outboxed Calvin Cater for three rounds and from right there, from that point on, Hanato was like, I don't even need to grapple these fools. I can outbox all of them. And it really put him on a bit. You know, like when, when, a, when a grappler falls in love with their hands, it's a bad thing. And that's exactly what Hanato Moicano did. He beat Calvin Cater in a boxing match. And then he said, I don't even need to grapple anymore. It's too tiring trying to get takedowns. I'm going to beat these fools on the feet. And then he learned his lesson. I fell in love with the box. <laughs> Great quote. Um, if this fight is at 1.5, I'm going over immediately. It is indeed at 1.5. So the over under set at 1.5. The over one and a half is a minus 115. Um, the under one and a half is minus 115. So straight pick them there. Jalen Turner opened up minus 250. He's currently minus 235. And then Mohanad Makano is plus 200. I'm not messing around with like a, a 1.5, but if you give me a 2.5 towards the under at a good price, I'll probably take it. But I, I doubt we're getting a good price on it. Um, any thoughts on any totals, any props you're looking at? Yeah, if it's minus 110 for the under 2.5 or for 1.5, it's going to be much fatter than that for the 2.5. Yeah. So it, you're going to have to lay a lot of juice. But yeah. I could absolutely see this one finishing inside the distance either way. Moicano submission, uh, Jalen Turner knockout or submission because, you know, that dude can flatline you with one shot and then just jump on a guillotine with the length that he has and finish you like that. So, yeah, this is um, this is going to be such a great fight. Once again, this is another fight that could easily headline one of these Apex cards, and it would be one that people were like, hell yeah. Turner Moicano, that's a headliner. So this is just how spoiled we are this week, man. This is a phenomenal fight. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it could absolutely headline a card, that's for sure. Uh, see if we got any more comments in here. Korean, yeah, Korean Zombie did crack the chin of Moicano, as did um, Rafael Fiziev, um, a couple other guys as well. Uh, this fight is a good prop round round three finish i'm kind of leaning early turner but yeah, it could be in any round uh what's up jacqueline all right i say we move on wheezy to the next fight and we have uh sadiq yusuf going against diego lopez we got sadiq yusuf 30 years old five foot nine with a 71 inch reach 
Diego Lopez, 29 years old, 5 foot 11 with a 72 inch reach. Lopez, one year younger, two inch height advantage and a one inch reach advantage. Sadiq Yusuf is three and two in his last five fights. Decision win against Andre Feely. Decision loss to Arnold Allen. Decision win against Alice Caceres. Uh, submission win against Don Shameless, Shane, Shaneus there. A decision loss to Edson Barbosa his last time out. As far as Diego Lopez, he is uh, four and one his last five fights. Made his debut against Mosver Evloev and his stock skyrocketed after a loss, which you, you don't see that too often. And then he gets a first round submission win against Gavin Tucker. And then a first round knockout win against Pat Sabatini. Weezy, this is one of the closer line fights on the card. And I think it's a really tough fight to break down because, you know, I'm sure, you know, Sadiq Yusuf is going to be a very popular underdog play this week. And I know that because Pat Sabatini was a very popular underdog play. Gavin Tucker was a very popular underdog play. You know, people continue to to bet against Diego Lopez. And I, I see why. I really do see why. I think Diego Lopez is very beatable. He doesn't have the best striking, the best striking defense. He doesn't have the best takedown defense. He's content to lay on his back and throw up submission attempts. But there's just something about Diego Lopez. Like, I picked him against Sabatini and Tucker just based off the fact that, you know, Sabatini had a clear path. You know, take down Lopez, get on top like Joe Anderson Brito. You're a black belt in BJJ. Stay safe for 15 minutes. But I was thinking to myself, man, Diego Lopez has 15 minutes to, to find the chin, to find a sub. And he just seems to find a way to win. Diego Lopez, although not the best striker, has a ton of power. And then, of course, he has that incredible grappling as well. So he's a really trick, tricky fighter to cap because there are some holes in his game, but he makes up with those. He makes up for those holes where, with heart, uh, durability, and just being dangerous everywhere the fight goes. So very tricky fight here to call Weezy. I'm really curious to hear your thoughts on this one. Yeah, what a fight this one is too. I mean, this is phenomenal matchmaking here because Lopez is white hot right now. I mean, this guy comes in. After losing on the contender series to Joe Anderson Brito, um, he he gets that short notice call up against Movzar Evloev and looks phenomenal. Puts Movzar in all kinds of bad spots, and it looked like he was going to get him out of there on a couple of different occasions. But you know, he he predictably lost to a guy who's never lost <laughs> in his career in Movzar, who's still undefeated. And then you know he, he Gavin Tucker's old and he submits him. Pat Sabatini has no chin. And he knocks him out. But you could say that, but Kevin Tucker and Pat Sabatini are great UFC wins. So, you know, so this guy, Diego, he's hot right now. He's he's the one of the people over at that team Lobo, uh, uh, the Lobo gym in Mexico, where he's training some of the hottest female fighters right now. This guy's Brazilian jiu-jitsu is so, so dangerous. But Sadiq Yusuf's a black belt. This guy's... You know, he's been training with Lloyd Irvin most of his career. He's He's got great Brazilian jiu-jitsu in his own right. Um, And Sadiq is a very underrated grappler. Like, you look over here and you see 22% takedown accuracy. Okay, that's not good. 55% takedown defense. That's not good. But it's the efficiency numbers that jump off the page, Brady, because... Sadiq's only got two takedowns, and he's been taken down nine times. So he's gotten two of the 11 takedowns in his fights, 22%. But he's getting, he's winning 57% of the control time uh, positions in his fights. He's only attempted nine takedowns. He's had 20 attempted against him. So he's attempting less than 33% of the takedowns in his fights, and he's getting 57% of the control time. And here's the other thing. How many takedowns did Diego Lopez have in the UFC? Zero. Zero. So if this is a boxing match, Sadiq's winning. I, and I like Diego's striking. He's very aggressive. And if you are as talented at Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as Diego is, you should be reckless as a striker because it's going to allow you to land big shots and it's going to create the scrambles that you need in order to use that Brazilian jiu-jitsu of yours. So even though Diego isn't really the most skilled minute winner, he's 0-1 in decisions in the UFC, and he's 2-4 and in decisions as a pro. So think about that, right? He's 2-3 and in decisions against low-level trash on the regional scene. You know? So it, he's not a minute winner. He doesn't get takedowns. And his striking, he's just too defensively irresponsible 
to win minutes on the feet, but it's that aggressiveness and uh, that 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 pressure and the power with which he throws that makes him so dangerous and it creates the grappling situations in his fights because a lot of people don't like having aggressive strikers in their face throwing constant volume. It it will make them wrestle instinctively, which is what Diego wants. But I think Sadiq's too clean for this kid, man. I think he's too good. He's fought the better brand of competition, um, especially overall, I mean. And when you look at the guys that are beating Yusuf, even that Barbosa fight, dude, that fight probably should have been stopped in the first round. Sadiq was beating seven shades of shit out of him. And then he just kind of, it looked like he may have either emptied the tank. That was his first five round UFC fight. So he lost a lot of minutes after that first round. But I mean, the only guy who came close to finishing that fight was Sadiq. So I, I'm going with I'm going with Super Sadiq Yusuf here. I think he's going to win this fight. I think he could even potentially find a finish here um, because I think he's the much better striker. And I think his grappling efficiency is severely underrated. And he's just been in there against much better strikers than Diego Lopez. And frankly, he's he's I mean, like, remember when he beat Mike Davis on Contender Series? He wasn't supposed to win that fight, Brady. But, I mean, he outstruck a phenomenal athlete in Mike Davis, outvolumed him, outlanded him. Um, and Diego Lopez is not on the on that kind of level with his striking. And like I say, even though he lost to Barbosa, he was this close to finishing him in the first round. Yeah, we, we you, you lit me the F up there, man. You lit me the F up. <laughs> what did I do to you? I don't know. I agreed with 110% of your breakdown. Like, I agreed. There's so many reasons to pick Yusuf. I just think he's probably getting finished is the thing. Like, there's so many reasons to like Yusuf. I just think Lopez is different, man. And uh, uh, yeah. if, if Lopez wins this fight, I'm going to be getting this. The emo wig. Yeah, man. He's got a He's got an interesting haircut. It is different for sure. You know, and I think that could be a little bit confusing sometimes. <laughs> I think it is too. No, but uh, yeah, I mean, honestly, Yusuf probably should be the favorite, right? Like you, you just rattled off a ton of reasons to like him, and I agree with every single one. It's just um, somebody in the chat did mention it. Sadiq's uh, uh, his durability, I don't think, is the greatest. We've seen him hurt in a couple of different fights, and I think uh, Lopez might be able to to take advantage there. Uh, yeah, look at all the red. Yeah, he has a ton of red. Uh, Sadiq is is pretty chinny. He's been hurt quite a few times. Um, if it's on the ground, Lopez wins. If it's on the feet, Yusuf wins. Uh, <laughs> Weezy, stop lighting me up. What's wrong with you? Dude, we're both passionate this week. This is the best card of the year, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm making very bold statements about New York and, and Italian pizza. This is this is definitely a contentious stat figures this week, without question. Uh, I think Lopez is going to hurt him bad on the feet, not because he's a better striker. I just think he is more of the fate of uh, Sidi Yusuf Shen. Yeah, Lopez is not the best striker. He does, does carry some power. Yeah. Yeah, beating Mike Davis, very impressive. Uh, Yusuf looked like hot garbage. Yeah, that fight was so weird. It's like Yusuf 10 sevens Barbosa in the first round, and then just, just the rest of the fight just doesn't show up. It was weird. Um, his hair almost look, it does look fake. <laughs> like, is that, I'm wondering if he's wearing like a wig, do you think? I don't know. Yeah, I'm surprised, man, because you don't see a lot of South American dudes with that haircut. You know, that's something you see in California and New York. You know, <laughs> you don't see it down there. So anyway, uh, yeah, but but Lopez, you know, he can cut his hair whatever he like he wants to. That dude is so dangerous. You know, it, it, nobody should be able to talk shit to him, and he he could find submissions. And he, like we said, he's very aggressive on the feet, and he flashes some power there as well. This is a great fight. Yeah, it is. Dawes saying it's probably the easiest gambling card and I've seen in my well help help us out, Dawes. Drop drop the place. Let's see what you got. Uh Diego Lopez is gonna come out to Alice at Chain. <laughs> I can see it. I can see it. All right. Yeah, man. Let's move on to the next fight. We have uh Holly Holm going against Kayla Harrison. We got Holly Holm, 42 years old, five foot eight with a 69 inch reach. Kayla Harrison. Uh, 33 years old, five foot eight with a 66 inch reach. We got Kayla Harrison, nine years younger, same height and a three inch reach disadvantage. Holly Holm is uh three, one and one, no contest in her last five fights. Decision win against Raquel Pennington, decision win against Irene Aldana, decision loss against Ketlin Vieira, 
decision win against Yana Santos and then a no contest against Mara Bueno Silva in a fight where she got subbed, I believe, in the second round. As far as Kayla Harrison, four and one in her last five fights. Um, she is making her debut here. And I guess the big giant talking point is, you know, this fight is going to be at Bantamweight. And I guess how is, is Kayla Harrison going to make Bantamweight? She's primarily fought at lightweight. She does have one featherweight fight that I saw back in 2019. And then also um, she was also supposed to fight, I think, uh, Julia Budd. At featherweight as well, but that fight got canceled. So she's going to be cutting down to bantamweight for the first time in her career at 33, almost four, at 34 years old. Uh, judging by her Instagram, she does look like a lot leaner. Like she doesn't even look like the same person. So just judging by that, she looks fine. It's just we still got to see it uh, come Friday. With all that said, if she does make weight, make bantamweight, and look good doing it. It's hard not to pick her just to take down the 43-year-old and, and just control her across 15 minutes. But that that um, the weigh-ins for this fight specifically is something I have my eye on. I want to see Harrison make weight. I want to see her look good on the scale. And if she does, um, I'm picking her to win regardless. I think she's like a minus 500 favorite, which is, which is pretty crazy last I saw. But I'm going Harrison. I just don't have an interest in betting this fight. I think there's a lot more spots I like other than this one here, like laying minus, let's see, minus five. Minus 460 on Harris and no thank you. Wheezy, what are your thoughts on this matchup? Yeah, my thoughts are is that, I mean, it's really easy to see Kayla doing what she does very well and kind of easily winning this fight. But at the current line, there's just too many questions that are unanswered about Kayla Harrison, right? How does this weight cut go for her? You know, this could potentially be a, a situation where she makes weight, but just doesn't ever doesn't perform like we're used to seeing Kayla Harrison perform because let's I mean most of her career 155 pounds some fights at 145 and she was struggling at 145 and you know what Kayla looks great in that picture but that's still a 145er that we're looking at right there she's never sniffed 136 pounds any point in her judo career or mixed martial arts career. So that's a big unknown is how is this weight cut uh, going to gonna affect Kayla Harrison. But, you know, we have seen a couple of weight cuts recently. Chidi Anjikawani recently oh, down to 170 where it was like, whoa, this is really weird. This fight taking place at 170. How is Chidi going to look? But, you know, now with USADA gone, you know, uh, I think that some of these fighters that are making like dangerous cuts might be doing them a little bit better, might be having uh, a little bit of an edge there. So that's something we have to talk about. But let's face it. I mean, this fight takes place on the feet for 15 minutes. Holly's going to win. If Kayla doesn't get takedowns, Holly probably wins here. Who's fought the better brand of competition over their career? Come on, man. That's not even close. I mean, Kayla's been crushing cans in PFL up at 155 pounds, women with no athletic ability, you know, not, not even close to the accolades that, that Kayla Harrison has in her grappling career. I mean, Kayla's judo is so ridiculous, Brady. I was watching her tape and some of the throws that she's getting, it's so clear that she's setting up a throw with, with first showing her opponent the throw that she's not going to go for. She'll step in on an inside reap, like she's going to go for an inside reap, and uh, when when the, when the um, when her opponent shifts their weight, she'll step in with the other leg and then go to a head wheel and just absolutely land it and put them flat on their back. Her double leg entries, Brady, they're so fucking good. You know, women with a with a judo background like Kayla Harrison should not, they should suck at wrestling. They should absolutely suck because if you've been doing judo your whole life, the one thing that you never fucking learned how to do was shoot a double leg or a single leg. And her double legs are so explosive. Her timing on, on uh, when her, uh, her opponent will come in with an overhand, right. And she'll just duck underneath and blast double these hoes and put them flat on their back. And then once they're there, she lands a ton of ground and pound. Kayla Harrison's not the type of fighter that's going to get takedowns and then not do anything when she's on top. You know, she's going to be landing ground and pound. She's going to be staying heavy. She's going to be advancing position. And she's going to be looking to set up that arm triangle from the top position 
or get to your back and finish with the rear naked choke. Kayla can finish with ground and pound or submissions. But like I said, Brady, there's just a lot of unanswered questions here. How does she look at 135? How does she look in the UFC in front of a massive live crowd at UFC 300? You know, can we can we kind of say that, you know, Holly Holm is probably a tougher fight than some of these girls she's fighting at 145 and 155? You know, Maria Mactanina, uh Aspen Ladd, Martina Jindrova. I mean, like the toughest opponent that she's had is Larissa Pacheco. And Larissa's like, Larissa's a fucking dude. You know, she's a 155 pound dude. Okay. So, I mean, yeah, it, it's, you know, the, of course she's going to have a tough time finishing somebody like Larissa. She never finished her and she even lost well, her only pro loss comes to Larissa, but that's up at 155 pounds. So, yeah, I mean, I think Kayla's special. Her grappling is phenomenal. I can't believe how good her wrestling is for a for a lifelong judoka. So, yeah, I think she probably wins this fight, but I've got to see her on the scale, man. And I even think before the scale, there's nothing wrong with taking a small shot on Holly Holmes' money line here because we just don't know how Kayla's going to translate at this level and at this weight. Yeah, Doss saying rumor has it. Uh, Harrison's already on weight, which would be crazy. If uh, I don't, I haven't heard that though. But um, Holly is just too old 10, 10 years ago. Come on, I mean, she'd have been thirty three at that point. Um, weight cut is going to hurt Caleb badly. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, I'm saying I'm gonna wait for weight. I'm not even betting on this fight, but I, I am curious to see how she does look. Oh, uh, let's see. I keep an eye on the weigh-ins for sure, for sure. Uh, Holly home round three. I don't know. Uh, what's interesting, though, is this total. So uh, the over under set at two and a half rounds, the over two and a half opened up minus 250. It's now minus 135. The under has gotten pounded, opened up plus 200. It's currently plus 105. I would kind of lean the over. I mean, I know Harrison's a decent finisher, but Holly Holm is no bum. She's no bum. And if you look at that number, Brady, you know, she's seeing two takedown attempts for fight. She's had 33 takedown shot against her. She gets controlled less than 6% of her UFC cage time. And that's over 250 minutes. So there are some reasons on paper to get to a Holly Holm money line right now. And then if Kayla shows up looking like hot garbage on the scales, you you can arb out. You know, could be, because her line is going to plummet if that's the case, because that's the biggest worry we have here is that we don't know how Kayla's going to look at 135 and how she's going to perform there. So, yeah, man, there's a lot of reasons to like Holly here, but we both know, you know, that this girl could get a takedown early in the fight. And then you're going to be like, Christ, this could be over shortly thereafter because Kayla's that dominant on the ground. I bet the Kayla Harrison, they have takedown props already. I mean, yeah, I, I, I on bet online, do they right now? Not on bet online, man. They've only got um, uh, totals out so far. There's no props out yet. Maybe he, he's betting like props with his friends. Maybe they're, his friends set a prop. Well, they, they, he could have maybe played it on prize picks already or uh, because they probably have that out on prize picks already. They didn't when I did my video, unfortunately, but maybe they just got him out. Okay. Yeah. So, you know, it's UFC 300. So some of these books are probably going to get some stuff out early. Yeah. Price pick still doesn't have anything out. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, he always oh, said he would. He would bet it. Oh, yeah. I okay. mean, he would bet it. All right. Yeah. I'd bet it too. I think she gets a takedown here. I'm re pretty confident she gets a takedown. Uh, <laughs> I'm not uh, betting this. I do really want to see that Batista. Yeah. So, uh, so apparently, uh, Kayla Harrison's going to Batista bomb Holly Holm. Oh, wow. Yeah. Kayla's good on the mic, man. When she's had some of these interviews she has after her fights, uh, definitely she's got some, she's, she's a charismatic woman uh, and she's very good on the mic. So yeah, it's, I, I like hearing her say things like that. Yeah. All right, we let's move on to the next fight. We got Calvin Cater going against Aljamain Sterling. We got Calvin Cater, 36 years old, 5 foot 11 with a 72 inch reach. Sterling, 34 years old, 5 foot 7 with a 71 inch reach. Sterling, two years younger. It's going to be Cater with a four inch height advantage and a one inch reach advantage. Calvin Cater is uh, two and three his last five fights. Decision win against Dan Ige. Decision loss to Max Holloway. Decision win against Giga Chikadze. A uh, decision loss to Josh Emmett, then a knockout loss injury versus Arnold Allen. As far as Aljamain Sterling, four and one, 
his last five fights, decision win against uh, Piotr Jan, or DQ win against Piotr Jan, decision win against Piotr Jan, knockout win against uh, TJ Dillashaw, decision win against Henry Cejudo, then a knockout loss against Sean O'Malley. So obviously uh, the, the big news is uh, Aljamain Sterling's coming up a weight class here to take on Calvin Cater. And it's an interesting matchup because, um, you know, I, Calvin Cater does have really good takedown defense and on the feed he has really good boxing, really good volume, some power as well. But Sterling is striking is good in his own right. I think this is one of the closer fights on the car. I'm curious to hear your take on this one. Yeah, right. I mean, this is an interesting one, but I think that there's a lot of good reasons to just kind of stay away from this fight. Number one, you know, Aljo up at 145, that's that's a new thing for him. And he's fought his entire career, 27 pro fights, 19 fights at the UFC level since 2013, all of them at, at bantamweight where he was the bigger dude. And now he's going to be four inches tall or he's going to be four inches shorter than Calvin Cater and have a one inch reach disadvantage here. Um, in addition to that, Aljamain Sterling over his career at bantamweight, only 24% on his takedown attempts. So um, he's not the greatest wrestler. He really isn't. He's not accurate with his takedown attempts. His takedown defense is trash. So, But he has done a good job of winning minutes in, in the control time positions. But, and, and it's a big but, the, the efficiency, it's not great. He's attempted 136 takedowns and only 42 attempted against him, but yet he's only getting 60. He's only winning 62% of the control time positions in his fights. He's attempt. He gets about two takedowns for 15 minutes, but Calvin Cater has got 91% takedown defense and he's, he's his fights stay standing 95% of the time. So, uh, and that's over 176 minutes of UFC cage time. So Calvin's very good at keeping the fight standing. But what I, th what I think is interesting about this is, you know, we have to look at these numbers on paper, and it's hilarious. I mean, like, if you look at the numbers on paper, Aljo's the better striker. Aljo's got a positive 2.43 distance striking differential. Cater's got a negative 2.34 distance striking differential. Aljo is more accurate by 7% at distance. Aljo is more defensively responsible at distance by 8%. You know, Calvin's one of these guys. He's 7 and 5 in the UFC. He's got four of his seven wins by KO. He's very durable. The guy's literally never been finished in the UFC outside of the Arnold Allen fight where he blew out his knee in a freak accident. You know, so Calvin's an extremely durable guy. He's just not a minute winner at distance. It's pretty wild, man. How the hell does Calvin Cater get outlanded by 2.34 significant strikes per minute? I, I have the answer. Wins? I have the answer for that, Wheezy. Why? And the answer is Max Holloway landed. It's not just that fight. He gets 400. outlanded in every goddamn fight. I looked at the numbers. I don't get it. It wasn't just the Holloway fight. Really? I mean, he outlanded Emmett and Giga, uh, Dan Ige. I think are you frozen? No, I'm not. I'm not. I, I, oh. I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure he got outlanded in those fights. Like if you no. dude, he's landed 905 and absorbed 1255. He's actually a, he's absorbed 400 more strikes at distance than he's landed 400. So how many did he get outlanded by in the in the Holloway fight? 200? Uh, 300, 300 and uh 12 313 he got outlanded by 313 yeah or, or max landed 313 no max landed 445 and and calvin landed 115 144 144 Holy so shit. 312 312 <laughs> even outside of that fight this dude's getting outlanded by 100 significant strikes or by uh, by every opponent not named max holloway so it's just odd to me because Calvin is an excellent striker. He is winning fights that are staying at distance. He's very durable and he doesn't really get knocked out. But, dude, I think Aljo might do more. And I think the threat of the wrestling might be enough for him to keep it close enough on the feet. And if he does find the back in a scramble, like he did a couple of times against Peter Yan, he's going to ride out the round there, win the round, you know. And this is only a three round fight. So I actually think that. 
Aljo is live. And also another thing we have to take into, to, into account here, a year and a half layoff for Calvin Cater, a guy who's been very active as a professional. 30 pro fights in 17 years, but he's coming off a one and a half year layoff here. So he's a guy that's used to fighting twice a year, but he's on this layoff due to the knee injury that he suffered in the Arnold Allen fight. So how is he going to look at 36 years of age coming off the uh, the first serious injury of his career that I know of? That's going to be an interesting piece of information to take into account here. But also you have to worry about how does Sterling look at featherweight? So I, I think it's one of those fights where I'm going to be staying away from this one and just kind of gathering some information because I think there's a lot of variance here. Yeah, especially because I think it's a close fight. I think it goes to decision, so the judges are probably going to screw it up anyway. But um, can, Calver, can Calvin Cater keep it on the feet? I highly doubt it. I mean, I think he does personally, but um, we'll see. If, if Aljo gets the back, I mean, that could, that could be the round for sure. Um, did anyone bet WrestleMania today? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, Algermaine Sterling has an OnlyFans. That is that is wild. So I, th I think that's the, the second OnlyFans of the card, Andraj, but she deleted hers. So do we even count that at this point? Yeah, I don't think, I mean, if, if it's not a current OnlyFans, then I don't think we can count it. But why does Sterling have an OnlyFans? I don't know. And I don't want to, I don't want to find out uh, the over two and a, yeah, the over two and a half should, should hit here, but I'm guessing it's, it's pretty juicy. Yeah. Minus two twenty to the over. Yeah. 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 I think it goes over, you know, because cater is extremely difficult to finish, extremely durable and caters while he's a good knockout threat. Um, not really like this murderous power puncher either. So yeah, probably goes over, but man, minus two twenty. That's a lot uh let's see i'm starting to uh root against the uh ray longo fighters to be honest over two and a half parlay piece could be but it is it is laying some chalk and all right cater is the the pick for me if you can stuff some take that we need to bring up a good point though um i think the the numbers will be fairly fairly close and competitive but i think the power is all in favor of cater though al does not doesn't have really have much power there close fight in my opinion uh, let's see where the line is at. So we talked about the over. Uh, Aljamain Sterling is minus 146, and Calvin Cater is plus 126. I, I think this has split decision written all over it, personally. So it um, should be an interesting fight. Uh, y'all do realize that fighters have only fans for Fight Week content behind the scenes, or are y'all trolling? <clears throat> um, I mean, uh, I guess we're trolling. Um, I don't yeah, know. I don't know. You know, I mean, I've never visited Bill Algio's OnlyFans, and I mean, to be fair, I never uh, anybody's OnlyFans. I would have to. I've never seen any of them. So, well, shout out to Abdi. Like, we wouldn't know if if it wasn't for Abdi subscribing to, to you know Bill Algio's OnlyFans and uh, <laughs> Dennis Suzuki's OnlyFans and and uh, Billy Q's. Only. So we we appreciate you know fellas like Abdi going out there and doing the dirty work for us. So, so now we do know. It is behind the scenes, no nudies, um, at least uh, for like guys like Chepe. Uh, and I think uh, Eileen Perez and Marina Moreau, that's a different, that's a much different story. Yeah. Yeah. The female fighters for sure. Moreau's especially. Yeah. They're making a ton of money yeah. on OnlyFans. And that's why the fade, that's why the fade comes. Like, look, yeah. look at Kay Hansen. He became like a professional model after a while and was just like, I'm making so much more money on OnlyFans. She was even like, fuck this weight cut shit. I'm not going to be showing up on weight because I'm going to make so much more money on OnlyFans than I am showing up for this fight. Yep, yeah, 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 for sure. We, we appreciate you, Abdi. We appreciate you 100%. <laughs> um, yep, all the – is Aljo posted feet picks up in there? I don't know. I, but <laughs> I don't know. Uh, what's up, GM, GMC? What is up? All right, guys, we have 200 of you in here watching. You guys could smash a like button. Subscribe here to Post Force. We go live every – Sunday, 7.15 Eastern time, unless there's like a Super Bowl or or unless uh, there's a vacation, we are here 7.15 all the time. All right, uh, let's move on to the next fight. And believe it or not, Wheezy, this is a prelim. This is a prelim, yeah. which which goes to show you how stacked this card is. Yuri Prohoshka going against Alexander Rakic. We got a Yuri, he's 31 years old, six foot three. With a 80 inch reach, Rakic, 32 years old, old uh, six foot four with a 78 inch reach. Uh, Yuri's one year younger. It's going to be Rakic with a one inch height advantage and a two inch reach disadvantage. 
We have uh, Yuri, who is four and one his last five fights, made his debut against Volkan, won that fight by second round knockout, uh, knocked out Dominic Reyes, submitted Glover to share in round five, and then lost to Alex Pereira by knockout. As far as Rakic, he is three and two in his last five fights, a knockout win against Jimmy Manawa, a decision loss to Volkan Uzdemir, decision win against Anthony Smith, a decision win against Thiago Santos, and then a knockout loss against Jan Blachowicz. So in, in my opinion, this is kind of a clash of styles in a sense of – you know, Alexander Rakic, I am not a big fan of his fights. I think his fights are, quite frankly, just boring. I mean, I think he's an incredible fighter, incredible talent, but it, his last five fights have just sucked. I mean, that Jan Blachowicz fight was terrible. Not a ton went down, um, ended up hurting himself in the third round. Up until then, he landed only 27 significant strikes. The Thiago Santos fight was tough to watch and went 15 minutes. He landed 36 strikes in 15 minutes against Anthony Smith. Get Anthony Smith dead to rights. He takes him down and lays on him for 15 minutes. Horrible fight. And then the Uzumir fight was a horrible split decision where a ton didn't go on. So Rakic, kind of a boring fighter. But yeah, like I said, he's really good. He's very powerful. And he's a very smart fighter at that. Whereas Jiri is, is just a complete madman. I think something's seriously wrong with this guy. Um, but I think it works in his favor a lot of times. I'll never forget the debut of Yiri Prohashka against Volkan Uzdemir because I didn't know a lot about this dude. Um, but he shows up, and what I noticed was he was literally blocking punches with his face. Wheezy. And I know, we, I know we, we joke around sometimes and say, like, oh, you know, he blocks punches with his face. Yuri literally blocks punches with his face. He's the definition of blocking punches. In that Uzdemir fight, he was literally headbutting uh, Uzdemir's punches, and the announcers were like, this guy's a madman. Yeah, he, he absolutely is a madman, just headbutting the punches. And then I remember at one point, Yuri grabs his hands, interlocks his fingers, and puts his hands down below his waist. He has those long ass arms, and his hands are all the way down below his knees, and he's still headbutting punches. It's hilarious. And he's eating all these shots. You know, Volkan did hurt him in the first round, but, you know, Yuri's super tough. Um, but yeah, he, he gets hurt in every fight. He got hurt in the Uzdemir fight. He got flash knocked out in the Reyes fight while on top. He got hurt multiple times in the Teixeira fight, and then he got hurt in the Behera fight and then knocked out in the second round. So I worry about the striking defense of Yuri. I mean, he doesn't even have any striking defense and a guy like Rakic, who is very powerful when he does throw, when he does land, it's very powerful. So, um, although I'm not a big fan of Rakic, I kind of like him here just due to the fact that I think Yuri's going to like force a fight out of Rakic and you can't be this hittable up against, up, up against these big, you know, light heavyweights that hit this hard. And Rakic is certainly one of them. So I'm kind of leaning Rakic here. And I think Rakic might knock out, a uh, year in this matchup, but Weezy, what are your thoughts on this fight here? Yeah, dude, we got almost a two year layoff here for Alexander Rakic. So look, if you're not a hundred percent against a guy like Jiri, it's a problem because this guy is mentally ill for yeah. Chaska. You yes, know yeah. I mean? He is an absolute madman. This guy has no concern for his own safety and his durability is so next level that he, I mean, like, there are so many times where he's losing fights and then he comes back to win them. I mean, like, the best example was the Glover Teixeira fight with that submission out of nowhere in the fifth round. But that was a fight where there were so many changes of momentum. And the one thing that I think I, I, I'm pretty confident about here with Rakic is, is that this guy is not a killer like Prochaska is, you know, this guy is a guy who actually in his last four fights has done everything possible to avoid fighting. Yes. And, and that's very alarming because Jerry Prochaska is going to come in there fighting from the word go. And, and Rakic is probably going to be scared shitless because he's looked scared. He He's like you say, dude, this guy doesn't do jack shit. He didn't even get a takedown against, against Anthony Smith. Right. He won that fight with like 14 minutes of control time. But Anthony Smith was like literally jumping guard and then getting his face pounded through the mat. Did, did Rakic throw, show any kind of urgency? No. Did he show any kind of confidence at distance striking range? No. He looked to lay on top and do as little as possible against a guy who's just not dangerous right now. Um, what did he do against Tiago Santos? You know, a guy who hasn't knocked anybody out in like five years. He fought petrified the entire time. How is that going to work against Jiri? 
Are you asking? That? I mean, yeah, I don't... that's what I'm asking you, dude. What, what I mean, a... like, how how are you going to fight scared against Jiri Prochaska and last 15 minutes? I don't think it's going to happen, dude. I think Jiri's going to destroy this guy. And then we've got the knee injury to worry about, a two year layoff for Rakic. You know, Prochaska doesn't win minutes. You know, this guy's only been to decision twice in 34 fights. So how is Rakic going to knock this guy out? He couldn't knock out Tiago Santos. He couldn't knock out Anthony Smith. He lost to Volkan Ozdemir. And he wasn't doing shit against Blahovic either. I had Rakic in that fight. I bet him in that fight. And yeah, of course, he was going to win it, I think. But he blew out his knee. And he blew out his knee not doing anything. It wasn't even a contact injury he took a wrong step and it was over so man against a guy like jerry if you're not knocking that dude into the fucking the middle of next week you're not beating him and guess what i don't think rakic is knocking anybody into the middle of next week if you're not knocking out anthony smith i don't think you're knocking out jerry prochaska i think jerry's gonna bring a fight to this guy i think he's gonna make Rakic do something that we haven't seen him do since Jimmy Manoa and since his uh, debut. Uh, I remember there was a fight. I think it was his debut where he just looked phenomenal. But Rakic is, you know, he's actually older than Prochaska. You know, Prochaska's still got the two-inch reach advantage. He's got the experience advantage. He's been a lot busier lately, and he's fighting the better brand of competition by a mile at the UFC level, man. So, I'm going. I'm on Team Jerry here. I think he's going to get the job done. Yeah, I mean, I'm. I'm hoping. Well, I know that Jerry's going to bring the fight, so I'm hoping it's not boring. I mean, these last Rackage fights have just been just brutal to watch. I mean, um, that's why I was kind of pissed off. Like, whenever I saw this fight was on the card, I'm like, you couldn't have gave Yuri any, literally anybody else. You had to give him the most boring fighter in the in the division. But I'm hoping Yuri brings a fight out of Rackage, and I'm hoping. Rakic is is forced to fight. That'd be nice. Um, but yeah, we have Rakic as the favorite. He opened up uh, minus one ten. Pick him. He's currently minus one thirty six. And then Neary opened up minus one ten. He's currently plus one sixteen. The over under is set at two and a half rounds. The over two and a half is plus one twenty five. The under two and a half is minus one fifty five. The under is solid. It's just um, yeah. I think the I think the under solid. I think the under solid. Like it's a Yuri fight, but. Yeah. But at the same time, it's also a Rackage fight, and uh, you know, relying on a Rackage finish could be you know something that that pisses you off by the end of the night. So yeah, not much sticking out here for me. But I think the under at minus one fifty is is not terrible. I'd say. Yeah, it's a jury fight. Thirty four fights, two of them have seen the scorecard. So yeah, man. I mean, those are the kind of spots where at just over sixty percent implied probability, you should be fairly comfortable laying juice there. But I got to tell you, man, I think I'd rather just bet uh, Jiri inside the distance. You're going to get plus money on that. And I just think there's a lot of unanswered questions about Alexander Rakic at this point due to two-year layoff. I mean, do you want to have ring rust against Prochaska? I mean, just that guy's haircut is is like kind of scary. You know, yeah. the, 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 the lack of concern for his own personal safety or defense for a guy who's 29 and 40. Four is terrifying. I mean, I love this guy, Jerry. He's one of my favorite fighters in the entire promotion. And I think he goes through Rakic like a hot knife through butter and shows that there is one guy in this cage in this fight that's going to be looking to murder his opponent. <laughs> and that dude's name is Jerry Prochaska. And he's more durable. He wants it more. He's more dangerous. And he's just way wilder. So one of the fights for Jerry that went to decision was a two-round fight. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Oh my God. Oh my God. And even that that uh that to share a fight that went into the fifth, that one finished, you know, but still that was an incredible fight. I remember the my favorite one was when he fought Vadim Nemkov on the regional scene in, in Russia. And the first round was 10 minutes, and it was such a back and forth round that Vadim couldn't even get off the scale after or couldn't even get off the stool after the first round. And Vadim won like eight minutes of that round. So, yeah, this guy Prochaska is next level tough. Yeah, I mean, this uh, right here is uh, a face of men mental illness right there. 
This guy lives in the goddamn forest. Yeah. Who lives in the forest? This guy. There's nothing there, dude. Like, you have to hunt in order to get food, and then you got to create your own fire and then cook what you hunted, skin it. You know, like, this guy's an, this guy's an absolute maniac. I mean, like, he's living by codes that Japanese men lived by centuries ago. Because they had to, because they were lunatics, because of the Bushido code. And this guy's doing it in the year of our Lord 2024, living in the forests of the Czech Republic, not giving a shit about defense or his own personal safety or about what anybody might think of his incredibly strange haircut. I'm here for all of it, man. Thierry Prochaska, ass shaving of the week, most likely. I can't wait for this one, man. Prash is going to bring the, he's going to force right. Rakic is going to have to fight. He's going to have to. Um, Yuri's fight IQ is horrendous. Um, more so this is the striking defense. Uh, fight is a good decision as a parlay piece. Potentially, potentially. Um, a spinning elbow, KO on Domery, and that was nasty. Yeah. Yeah, um, Dom hasn't been the same since that one, man. He's he's punching and kicking trees like blood spore. Yeah, he is. He is. He punches trees. This guy does. <laughs> I was trying to find like a, a video of him like punching a tree or something, but I couldn't. Let's see. Here's a training video. Let's see what he's. What is? It? Is that a just a picture? That's a I weird. That's just a, that's a that's a yoga pose right there that he's doing. One of the weirder poses I've seen. Yeah, I'm not sure what that one is actually. All right, here we go. Now, this might have swayed me. He's doing sun salutations right there for any uh, for any yoga people. God, look at how long he is. <laughs> Can you imagine getting hit by that dude? No, I, I can't. It would hurt so bad. He's so awkward. And, and yeah, I know. He's so dangerous. He's so awkward. He don't see he, nothing he, like it. Like the 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 timing on his punches are something that you just don't see in the gym. You can't replicate it, and he it's clear that this guy has next level power. He just has that death touch that most people don't have. I mean, this guy does have pathetic fight IQ. And then look at his look at his record. How the hell do you go to twenty nine and four as a pro with bad fight IQ and no defense? It's well, incredible. This man's done it. It's incredible. All right, so that was the featured prelim, and it's a great featured prelim. It, it beats the the featured prelim like a, a month ago. Remember when we, they were featuring Eric Anders versus Jamie Pickett? Oh, and they were featuring that fight. I, I kind of I do it. remember that. I remember that, and that fight was boring too. I mean, the, the, <laughs> most, the most exciting part was when Pickett dropped Eric Anders. Yeah. That was crazy. I remember I was going, oh, shit, because I remember I had no money on Anders and the whole world was on him. And I'm like, yeah. oh, man, if he gets finished by Jamie Pickett, Twitter is going to explode. I was I was I would have last, laughed my ass off if you lost to Jamie Pickett. Uh, but, yeah, speaking of somebody who did uh, beat Jamie Pickett. Yeah. So we got the, the main card opener. There's a lot of outrage, Wheezy, about about this fight being on the main card. Which I mean, I can understand. Like talking through some of these prelims, the fact that we do have, you know, Bo Nickel, Cody Brunage is kind of weird. But they're they're clearly trying to build up Bo Nickel here. Uh, Bo Nickel, he's 28 years old, six foot one with a 76 inch reach. Uh, Brunage, 29 years old, six foot with a 72 inch reach. We got Bo Nickel one year younger, one inch height advantage and a four inch reach advantage. Bo Nickel five and zero in his only five fights. He had two submission wins on the Contender Series. He submitted Jamie Pickett in his debut and then he knocked out Val Woodburn in like 60 seconds. As far as Cody Brundage, he is uh 2 and 3 in his last 5 fights. Got knocked out by Mikel Olazechuk in the first round, submitted by Rodolfo Vieira in the second round. He lost a decision to SD Dumas. Uh, he brutally knocked out Jacob Malkoon in the first round and then he knocked out uh, Zach Reese in the first round as well. So I mean, what's 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 there really to say? Uh, Bo Nickel is currently the biggest favorite in UFC history. He can be had anywhere from minus two thousand three hundred to minus three thousand three hundred and thirty three. He's a he's a big giant favorite, and yeah, I mean the obvious pick here is is Bo Nickel. Um, you know, Cody Brundage, offensive wrestling solid, defensive wrestling not so much. Ground game off his back. 
has looked really bad. I mean, anytime this guy's on his back, he's getting finished. Mikel Olazajuk pounded him out. Uh, Vieira submitted him. Not the worst look in the world, but Vieira submitted him. Um, SD Dumas had 11 or so minutes of control time, took his back in that fight. Jacob Alcun was on his way to pounding him out in the first round, then, then forearmed, him, forearmed him to the back of the head. Uh, the list goes so on and so forth. Like Maximov took him down and controlled him. So, yeah, I think the, the ground game is, you know, at least on bottom, is a problem for Cody Brundage. And it's just hard to imagine Bo Nickel, you know, not going out here, taking this fight down to the mat. And, and once he does, that's that's probably that. So, yeah, it's Bo Nickel, Bo Nickel round one. I guess the big debate this week is I, I nobody's going to be picking Brundage. Um, the big debate is, is it going to be sub or is it going to be knockout? Mm-hmm. I would lean more so sub. That seems to be uh, what Nickel typically likes to do once getting fights down to the mat. But it could be ground and pound as well. And it's going to be one of those fights where, like, the, the submissions, like, like plus 110, the knockouts, like plus 120. They're going to make you pick between the two. So, um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, nickel submissions actually minus 110, and the nickel by knockout is plus 130. So terrible odds all around the board. The unders probably going to hit, but it's juiced. Uh, Wheezy, what are your thoughts on this fight, and are you taking the the big underdog shot here with Cody Brundage? Uh, you know, so – Somebody in the chat asked, you know, am I am I crazy to think the line is wide here? And I mean, no, you're not. I mean, it's minus twenty two hundred. Brady, have you ever thought of laying twenty two units to win one? Uh, y- yes. You have. <laughs> Whenever uh, uh, Chase Sherman took on um, Alexander Romanov. Oh yeah, okay. That was a bad matchup for Chase Sherman, but still, but no. you would have never ever laid twenty two units to win one. You would have never done it. You know, I would like have that was jokingly. Just, yeah, I mean, like jokingly, yeah. But you but know, never, of yeah. course, of course, it's a wide line. You know, Bo Nichols' entire pro mixed martial arts career has spanned six minutes. You know. There are still a ton of unanswered questions here, but there's a ton of answered questions on the Cody Brundage side. A, let me ask you this, Brady. How does Cody look off his back? Not not great. (laughs) Yeah, that's an understatement. I mean, this guy got pounded out by Mikhail Oleksiejczyk, whose ground game is hot ass. Like you said, Cedrique's Dumas, SD, oh. special delivery Dumas, you know, gets 12 minutes of control time on, on a former Division II national qualifier in Cody Brundage. Cody Brundage is horrible off his back, and his go-to submission, the guillotine choke, puts him on his back. So on paper, this is about as clean as it gets, you know, when, it, of course, the money line is minus 2,200 here. But, you know, Cody Brundage knocked out Jacob Malcoon in the first round, Brady. <laughs> I mean, look, I mean, like, these things can happen, you know, like weird shit happens. He got that slam knockout, you know, against uh, against uh, Reese. He got the, the guillotine choke against Dolce after getting, you know, beaten up prior to that you know so cody is cody finds some ways to win somehow and you know he's got good power on the feet you know cody's a lot more experienced he's fought the much better brand of competition he's a good wrestler in his own right but where the weaknesses are is exactly where bo nickel is just absolutely phenomenal I mean, this guy's a three-time national champion wrestler, or maybe four-time. I forget what it was at Penn State. I mean, and you know, Brady, you went there. I mean, Penn State is the best wrestling program in the country, and this guy was was the the featured you know wrestler on that on that team. So, yeah, it's Bo Nickel. The, the he's on this main card because he's that good of a prospect. He's the he's probably the most exciting prospect. That's come into the UFC since Shavkat Rachmanov, and uh, that's why they're giving him this spotlight, this this spotlight, this chance to shine, the chance to get people talking about who's going to be next for Bo Nickel. But yeah, man, Brundage in round one at plus four thousand. <laughs> Maybe I'll throw a quarter unit on it. What the hell, you know? <laughs> the friend of the show, a guy I've been I've been lucky enough to interview a couple of times. I'm rooting for him to shock the world here, but you know. 
Um, we got to be realistic about about his uh, chances here. Bo Nichols, uh, um, a once in a decade type prospect, and he's being featured on the UFC 300 main card because everybody in the UFC brass knows what this guy's ceiling is. It's very, very high. Um, so it, I'm really looking forward to seeing him take the next step because this, this is his toughest fight so far. Uh, Brundage is better than Pickett, better than Woodburn. Yeah, he is better than those two guys. I mean, yeah, look at that level of competition, man. It's uh, it's horrible. This this would yeah. be his best win by a mile, and it's Cody Brunage. It's, it's kind of funny, but yeah. Um, I mean, I cashed on uh, Cody Brundage KO one against uh, Malcoon at plus eighteen hundred. <laughs> maybe I uh, do the old sprinkle here as well, because maybe maybe Nickel gets disqualified. You, yeah, dude. I mean, the crazy yeah, shit can happen. Yeah. This is a wild sport, you know. Like they could be like on the clinch, in the clinch, or over by the fence, and Bo Nickel could get his fingers caught in the fence and like break two fingers, and the fight would just be over. You know, I mean, it's a wild, wild sport. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what Cody has uh, for Bo in this spot because you know this is a step up in competition. But Bo Nickel is is a phenomenal prospect. Everybody knows that. Yep, this fight is literally unbettable. Agreed. If you put ten dollars on Cody Brundage, you'll lose ten dollars. Agreed. Even the under is insane. Agreed. Minus three hundred, is it? Yeah, it's like a Terrence McKenney. <laughs> it's like a Terrence McKenney under right there. Yeah, dude. It's so hard to make money on Bone Nickel. It really is because every that the secret's out that this kid is actually pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, nickel sub plus 105. The thing is, you know, at plus 105, that it could look like value. I mean, this guy's minus 3,000 on some books, so getting a, a sub prop, which I think is his best win condition at plus money, I don't think it's the worst look in the world. But how put how pissed would you be if it's a TKO? Like, it could just as easily be a TKO, is, is my problem. Uh, under a half round is plus money. I don't love that just due to the fact that uh, you know, Pickett was able to hang in there for a couple minutes, um, ended late first there. I don't, I don't know if I love it. I got 98 units on both to win a quarter unit. Heck yeah. That's what we like here on, on stat diggers that, that bankroll management, uh, 98 <laughs> units to, to win a quarter unit. Can't get better, any better than that. Uh, nickel arm triangle MGM or whatever book offers specific sub props. Yeah. I think it would be an arm triangle. And then yeah. if you're, and then on the Cody Brundage side, you bet that Gilly because at the very least he's going to try for it. And if you're going to try for it, you know, why, why not? Why not take a shot? Uh, who has Bo Nickel fought? He has fought, you see it right there, Val Woodburn, Jamie Pickett, Donovan Beard, Zachary Borrego, and John Nolan. I mean, it doesn't get any uh, worse worse than that. Yeah, and he disposed of all five of those hoes in less than six minutes total, Brady. So, yeah, uh, you know, you can really only beat who they put in front of you, and Bo Nickel is just absolutely shaving ass and whoever decides to get in the cage with him. So, and a lot of people think, that this Saturday is going to be no different. Yeah, is, is Nickel going to pie for now? He's, he's not going to pie for. Um, let's see here. Sub one is plus one thirty. <laughs> a sub one is plus one thirty. Wow. MMA Jesus has Cody, so we got one person on on Cody Brundage there. I, I think he might be one of the only ones. Which if 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 it hits, you're going to look like a genius. Inside the distance, minus seven fifty. Yeah, that is. <laughs> That is wild. Vegas would love a nickel KO. Uh, nickel wasn't looking to strike whatsoever on the ground against Pickett. He's a sub guy. Yeah, that's why I, I am leaning sub. I, he's not really a, a ground and pound guy, but we've seen Cody Brundage like TKO before. And uh, yeah, just because you shouldn't bet nickel doesn't mean you should bet Brundage. Yeah, nothing wrong with passing is always yeah. something I'd like to say. Nothing's wrong with passing. All right, Weezy, let's move on to the next fight. And yeah, this fight's freaking phenomenal. Charles Oliveira going against Armin Sarukian. We got Charles Oliveira, 34 years old, five foot ten with a 74 inch reach. Armin Sarukian, 27 years old, five foot seven with a 72 inch reach. We got Armin Sarukian, seven years younger. Oliveira with a three inch height advantage and a two inch reach advantage. Oliveira is four and one in his last five fights. Knockout win against Michael Chandler. Submission win against uh, Dustin Poirier and Justin Gaethje. Submission loss to Islam Mahachev, then a knockout win. Against Benilde Ryush's last time out. As far as Armin Sarukian, he is four and one in his last five fights. Knockout win against Joel Alvarez. Decision loss against Mateus Gamrot. Decision win against Demir Ismagulov. Knockout win against Joaquim Silva. And a knockout win against Benil Ryushin. 
man, the thing that jumps out to me instantly is is honestly just this line. I mean, Charles Oliveira at almost a plus 200 underdog seems pretty dang disrespectful considering like in his last 13 fights, he's like 12 and one. And that one loss comes to Islam Ahachev. I mean, look at some of these wins. Michael Chandler, Dustin Poirier, Justin Gaethje, Benil Dariush. And yeah, that loss came against Islam. Um, I don't understand this line. Like, I, I guess there's a path for Armin here in terms of maybe he does, you know, drop Oliveira, who gets dropped in pretty much every fight, gets on top and, and KOs him. But I think Oliveira is just as likely to land a big shot in the feet. Like, it wasn't too long ago when Armin Sarukin almost got finished by Joaquin Silva. And Joaquin Silva landed only like 30 something strikes in that fight. And um, one of those strikes, like, almost got Sarukian out of there. So I just feel like Oliveira is getting disrespected here. This line doesn't make a ton of sense to me. So this is a, a dog or pass spot for me. I, I struggled to, s to see how anybody could lay minus 230 on, on Armin here against Oliveira. I, I don't get it, Weezy. I don't get it either. I, I mean, I cashed on Oliveira against Benil Dariush. I cashed on Oliveira against Gaethje. I, you know, um, this guy's phenomenal. And what I love about Charles Oliveira is I don't think he gets enough credit for how aggressive this dude is on the feet. His striking is awesome. And it's because he's so aggressive with his striking that it sets up the grappling opportunities for him. I think Charles Oliveira is going to be doing much more work on the feet. I think he's going to be way more dangerous on the feet here. And I think that pressure and that, I mean, he brings constant pressure. Um, I think that, that uh, we're going to see Armin going out there trying to get takedowns. And if he does that and he and he's just not careful on the ground, this isn't Joel Alvarez, man. This is Charles fucking Oliveira. This is a former champion here. This is a guy who is the all-time submission leader in the UFC. He's just so much more aggressive wherever the fight goes. Um Sarukian is a guy, I think this is interesting here, right? You look at these clinch and ground striking stats. He lands 2.75 and he absorbs about one. So that's great. I mean, like it's a positive almost 1.8 distance strike, or I mean clinch and ground striking differential. But, you know, you look at the, the, the Silva fight and he landed like 40 strikes over a minute and a half period in order to finish that fight. Be, prior to that, you know, Armin wasn't doing great work on the ground. He was kind of getting takedowns and riding out top position, but he's not doing enough down there in order to win a ton of minutes, especially against a guy like Oliveira, who's just so much more dangerous. And if you take down Oliveira, the chances of getting swept or put in a real deep submission are definitely more than 50-50. Excuse me here. I got to cough for just a second break. Go ahead. Take your time. I was going to just get a drink of water. Yeah. Why not? Yeah, I'm with you here, man. I, I as as phenomenal as Sarukian has been at the UFC level. I mean, this guy's combined level of competition, 75 wins, 36 losses. He's beating guys that are 54 and 33 in the UFC and his only two losses came against Gamrot and Makachev who are a combined 21 and 3 in the UFC. So Armin's looked great and he's beating good names like Benil Dariush, D Demiris Magulov, Joel Alvarez. These are, these are good wins. Um, and he came in and he made his debut against uh, Makachev. And that was one of those fights where I think he got, you know, one of those losing performances where people are like, Oh damn, this kid's going to be fucking good. You know, if he, if he looked that good against Islam, you know, this kid's going to have a bright future. And Armin, dude, he's still only 27 years old. This guy's a phenomenal talent. And I get why he's the favorite. But once again, this is Charles fucking Oliveira. This isn't a, you know, like a 40-year-old Benil Dariush. This isn't, you know, a Demir Ismagulov who's a, you know, a minute winner at best, who's not dangerous at all. This isn't a washed up jo Joaquim Silva. You know, uh, even Alvarez, I think, is kind of a bum. You know, I I think he's just okay. Um, so Charles Oliveira, man, I mean, I, I could put money on on him as an underdog. And even if he doesn't cash, I feel good about doing it because I've made money on him as an underdog before. I love his style. And like you say, 
eleven and one in his last twelve fights, with the only loss coming to Makachev. Man, this is going to be a tough fight for Sarukian, and I think Oliveira does more wherever the fight goes. Yeah, great underdog pick in this week. Plus money shot on Charles Oliveira is going to be on my draft card this week. Yeah, I mean, it's all about the price. I mean, if it was a pick, I'm staying away. But, I mean, almost plus 200 looks like plus uh, 190 now. Yeah. On Oliveira, it's tempting. He was plus 211. Jeez. Yeah. But, yeah, plus plus 190 now for, for Charles Oliveira. It's a dogger pass for me. Uh, Cody in the under 0.5 rounds plus 7. Is that a real line on DraftKings plus 7,000? What do you think? That's like a draw. <laughs> I mean, a draw. dude, I mean, like, that's not, you know, uh, yeah, the Cody, he, that's when his wins come, right? Yeah, <laughs> that'd be great. One tenth of a game. unit to win 70? No, no, to win seven. One win tenth seven. of a unit to win seven, you know? Maybe that's the shot you take. I don't know. Man. What about five unit max bet to win 350 units? Wow. Retire. Can you imagine, like, you'd be. <laughs> you'd be going nuts if you hit that bet. You'd be like, you'd be like calling up Cody, being like, "Let me, let me make a donation to your favorite charity, man." You just, you just shocked the world and made me look like the smartest capper in the world. If you hit that one for a max bet, and, and I'm sure Bo Nickel and the under half of a round is probably like a pick 'em, <laughs> like minus one ten. It probably is, dude. Crazy. I mean, Bo is Bo is just yeah, yeah, minus twenty three hundred. It's crazy. Do Bronx all day. Every day, uh, maybe just like an Armin KO one. Yeah, I could see an Armin knockout. I could see it. Um, thank you, Bray. No problem, Joel. Do Bronx at plus one ninety? Yeah, I'm, that's all I'm saying. I'm saying it's a little bit, a little bit disrespectful. A little bit disrespectful. Agreed. Line should be. I think it should be closer to even. I agree. Uh, Charles Oliveira has an OnlyFans official OnlyFans in ambassador. So that is that the second or third fighter that has an OnlyFans? So Charles does, but I'm assuming it's uh, it's fight footage. Um, I'm sure Dixon, you can clarify it's it's no feet picks or nothing like that. <laughs> terrifying <Feet> picks. <laughs> uh, oh, Oliveira hates decisions. He absolutely does. Um, what is the so the under two and a half rounds is minus two hundred five, Weezy? Uh, I've got it at. Shows minus seven fifty on Bovada. I don't know why the hell that show. I mean, that's bizarre. Wait, Under what? one and a half. Wait, is this? Oh, I'm looking at Nickel Brundage. No wonder. <laughs> Under two and a half minus one thirty five on Bet Online. There's no way that's a real line. Yeah, because it's plus one fifty five for the over two point five. So right now, if you have Bovada. You can get plus one fifty five on the over, lay minus one thirty five on the under, and and get free money there. That's across the market, so that shouldn't be happening. So yeah, under two and a half rounds, if that's still available at minus one thirty five, let me look here. I gotta check. There's no way they wouldn't they wouldn't hang a line like that. Are you kidding me? Oh yeah, they got it at one and a half here. Yeah, that's what, yeah. So it's minus it's minus one thirty for the over one and a half plus okay. one hundred. For the under, yeah. So that's a mistake on on um on best fight odds. Yeah, they tend to make some mistakes there. Yeah, yeah. Minus minus one thirty five for an under two and a half in a Charles fight would be would be wild. I wonder if anybody got on that line or or if it even was a line today. I'm not sure. Uh, fight of the night here. Yeah, there's a lot of fight of the night contenders. Um, this <laughs> is certainly one of them. Yeah. Um, let's see. Hard fight to cap. Yeah, as most of Charles Oliveira fights are. Charles and Enz KO are probably the two plays here. I like, I honestly like both because I think Charles can knock out, like, Charles has a ton of power, but it could also be a, a club and stuff. Uh, Dubronx is always disrespected by the bookies. Yeah. Wasn't he a dog to Benil? He was. And I, I just didn't get that because Benil was like this massive dog to Gamrot. And I was like, man, Benil, I'm betting Benil at plus 170. And then he then they just flipped it like like Oliveira sucked all of a sudden. I'm like, oh, he beat Gamrot, so he's gonna beat Oliveira. Yeah, yeah. Oliveira plus 170. I made him the dog of the week that week. And I actually made him the ass shaving of the week Ooh. and cashed on that shit on that big plus money number. It was a great play. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll be I'll be on Dubronx here too, man. Plus 190. Come on, son. I gotta get on that. Come on. Uh, Charles, the king of under two and a half. Yes, I've cashed my yeah. fair shares of uh, unders with him. Charles gives instructional videos on how to properly dye your hair. Yeah, it looks like he just recently got the blonde hair back for this for this fight. 
you know it's happening, man. Charles is going to bring that that uh, that that Brazilian hair dye into the cage. Hopefully, he makes weight because it wear it weighs a ton. Mm-hmm. These guys, these Brazilians who come in with blonde hair, they miss weight a lot. I was thirty seconds late trying to, so it was a line. Uh, oh, what was wow. there? Um, at eight o'clock this morning, tough start to the day. Yeah, I probably wasn't there for for too long. A line like that. But all right, Weezy. Now we have three title fights in a row. We have the the BMF title, we have the strawweight title, and then we have the light heavyweight championship on the line. Let's start with the BMF fight here. We got Justin Gaethje going against Max Holloway. We got Justin Gaethje, thirty five years old, five foot eleven with a seventy inch reach. Max Holloway, thirty two years old, five foot eleven with a sixty nine inch reach. We got Holloway, three years younger, same height, and Gaethje with a one inch reach advantage. Gaethje is uh, three and two his last five fights. Submission loss to Nurmagomedov, a decision win against Michael Chandler. Submission loss to Charles Oliveira. Decision win against Raphael Fiziev and a knockout win against Dustin Poirier. Uh, Max Holloway, four and one his last five fights. Decision win against Calvin Cater. Decision win against Yair Rodriguez. Decision loss to Alexander Volkanovsky. Decision win against Arnold Allen, then a knockout win against the Korean Zombie. And yeah, we, I've been saying it all card. I think these two are, are going to swing dicks. And I think it's going to come down to who has the bigger dick. And uh, who do you think that is? For me, it's Gaethje. It's just Gaethje. You know, Holloway, 145 or coming up to 155. You know, I think the, the thing about this fight, Brady, is, is that Justin Gaethje is at 117 minutes of cage time in the UFC. 94% of his fights take place standing. And with Max Holloway, you got a guy who's had 400 minutes of UFC cage time. 85% of his fights stay standing. We did see him mix in a little wrestling against Yair Rodriguez. That's a guy that you would do it against. But outside of that, Max Holloway has eight takedowns in 24 fights. So when you're capping this fight, the stats give us a really nice hint on which, you know, where we should focus our capping on. And that's which guys win the minutes and the moments at distance striking range here. And if you can answer those questions correctly, you're going to bet this fight correctly. Yeah. Um, moment winning, clearly on the Gaethje side, right? Uh, more power, especially early. And then minute winning, probably close. Probably close, but as the fight goes on, maybe more towards Holloway. It's a tough fight to call. It really is. Um, you know, what I what I don't hate is just is violence, man. I, I, I wonder, do you have the... Uh, you don't have the prop template ready for the for the for the Gaethje fight yet, so we'll talk Thanks. about it on on a probability. But Gaethje like is extremely violent in his five round fights. I think he's never been to decision, right? He never has. But he's had a, he's had a, a, yeah, yeah. On the Holloway side, you got yeah, a guy wow. who could hit in the face with a shovel ten times in a row, and he just keeps coming forward. So it, it's a bizarre fight in that in that. Uh, because, like, yeah, Gaethje's the better m- moment winner, but who wins moments against Max Holloway? Exactly. Poirier, that's it. Yeah. I mean, and that was at what weight? 155. So, exactly. yeah, that's why when you say, like, who's got the who's got the bigger cock here? Who's going to be swinging their dick heavier? It's probably Gaethje. He's the natural lightweight, and Holloway is a guy who's a natural featherweight. So, um yeah, that, that's what this fight kind of comes down to for me. But it is a five-round fight, you know, and Max Holloway is a great minute winner, and he can find those distance striking exchanges. He's he's just as tall as Gaethje, and he's going to be at a one-inch reach disadvantage, but he's the younger guy here. Somebody said um, if Holloway's ever going to get chinned, it could be this one. So Holloway has absorbed – what is it? 2,527 strikes and he's never been knocked out and he's never been knocked down. Like I can't remember. Has he ever been knocked down? I don't think so. That's not once he's absorbed almost 2000 significant strikes in the UFC. He's never been knocked down and he's never been knocked out in his career. But if it does happen, this will be the fight. If he does get knocked out, I think this will be the fight. But even against Poirier, Poirier heard him like five times in that first round. Still didn't get dropped. He almost got dropped, but the cage kind of saved Holloway. So um, what I find interesting is what, what does this fight look like as it goes on? Because we've seen Gaethje kind of break before a long time ago, but we've seen him break before against uh, Poirier and Alvarez. And 
I could see Max Holloway maybe taking over down the stretch, but he's going to have to to walk through fire for sure. It's a it's a tough fight. Uh, what do they have the odds on this one at? So Gaethje opened up minus 140, went all the way down to minus 285. He's currently minus 175. Looks like money as of late has been pouring it on Max Holloway. He was at plus 245 at one point, now down to plus 150. And then, yeah, the total set at three and a half rounds, the over three and a half minus 150, the under three, three and a half is plus 120. The fight goes minus 110. The fight doesn't go as minus 120. I kind of like violence here, even though Max has never been finished. Like I, like I said, I feel like if he, if he does, if he's ever going to get finished, I feel like it's going to be this fight. And then we've seen Gaethje finished a ton. Like Gaethje's been knocked out twice. He's been submitted twice um, by really good fighters and by lightweights, but still, you know, maybe you could see Holloway getting him out of there late. But yeah, I think this is probably the most, uh, probably the most exciting fight in the card. Like this has not only fight of the year contender written all over it. This has like fight of the decade written all over it. This is such great matchmaking. I mean, you're going to get a, a guy in Gaethje who's a, who's a great finisher. Who's finished six of his eight UFC wins inside the distance against a guy who can't be finished in Max Holloway. One of the most durable guys to ever set foot in the cage. And frankly, just a phenomenal fighter, 18 and six in the UFC, former champion. The only guy who really like outdid him was Volkanovsky. You know, he lost to Conor McGregor back in the day. You know, I mean, he's he, this guy's been at the highest level of the UFC for a very long time. And uh, but, you know, the thing is, I, th I think we could see Gaethje get a finish here and not not because of head strikes, because of calf kicks. You know, Max Holloway's a boxer. He stays behind a really crisp and fast jab. But when you're jabbing, your weight is on that front leg. And, and Justin's going to be looking to chop that down. And I think if we see a finish here from Justin, it's going to be because he starts at the legs. And then once those legs go, that's when you can find the knockout upstairs, you know, or the good head kick upstairs that, that finishes it because you're going to the leg, going to the leg, going to the leg, chopping it down. And, and your, your opponent becomes so focused on that that you look down at the leg, throw that head kick up to the head, and, well, we just seen Justin already do that, haven't we, Reese, recently? We just, we just, yeah, we just did. Yeah. Uh, the over two and a half, yeah, I think it hits, but it's minus 240. So they're they're kind of on to it. The over yeah. two and a half, it, it's gotten smashed. Don't know if I love that price. Um, Justin will demolish Max's hands power. He's got heavy, he has very nasty leg kicks. I've got a same game parlay on Bet365. They're already doing the same game parlays. Jeez, that's I gotta Good. I gotta check out 365 then. Uh Max a late KO. Yeah, Max late props are always in play against anybody. Uh 2000 and 3000. I thought they were bigger prices than that. I think I saw like like 4000, 5000, like something crazy for these late uh, plays there. Uh and then Ice Viking, that seems like as safe as they come. Could be Max is super tough to finish, but yeah, should be a, a phenomenal fight there. Any any final thoughts on the fight before we move on? One, one more. If you beat Max to the jabs, beat up the leg and have good defense, you can beat Max just like Volk did. Yeah, Max um is 0-3 against Volk. No. So most people just dead problems with Volk, except your name when you're Islam Makachev. And then of course Ilya Tapuria is just a monster right now. So yeah, this is going to be a great fight, man. Five rounds, a uh, guy, a finisher against a guy who can't be finished. Yeah, I think Ice Vikings on onto something with that over two point five and Gaethje at plus one forty. I mean, Max is just so durable. I think that's how you get Gaethje's price down from minus one seventy to plus one forty and get him by his best win condition. Yep, makes sense. Oh, Gaethje hits different. Yeah, some of the best power in the division. Absolutely. All right, so let's move on to the, the strawweight title fight. We have Zhang Wei Li going against Yan Zhaonan. We got Zhang Wei Li, 34 years old, 5'4", with a 63-inch reach. Uh, Yan Zhaonan, 34 years old, 5'5", with a 63-inch reach. Same age there. It's going to be Yan Zhaonan with a 1-inch height advantage in the same reach. So Zhang Wei Li, she is 4-1 and one in her last five fights. A knockout loss to Rose Namajunas. Decision loss to Rose Namajunas. Knockout win against Ioana and Jacek. Submission win against Carla Esparza. And then a decision win against the very handsome Amanda Lemos. As far as Yan Zhaonan, she is 3-2 uh, and two in her last five fights. Decision win against Claudia Gadelia. A knockout loss to Carla Esparza. Decision loss to Marina Rodriguez. A decision win against Mackenzie Dern. Then a knockout win against Jessica Andrade. So... 
Uh, when it comes to this matchup, first and foremost, um, Zhang Weili is a really big favorite, and money's like poured in on her today. Like it was like I was looking at this fight yesterday. Zhang Weili was minus three fifty. She's currently, as I'm as I'm speaking right now, minus five hundred. So somebody dropped a bomb on Zhang Weili. It looks like, and yeah, for me, I, I think it's a pretty good matchup for Zhang Weili. I mean, it's hard to go back and watch that. Yang John Nan fight against Carla Esparza, which really wasn't too long ago. And just seeing what Carla Esparza was able to do, Carla Esparza looked like Hamzat Shemaev out there. And, you know, Carla Esparza really shouldn't be looking like Hamzat against against anybody, but she did against Yang John Nan. It was a, a brutal look. And since then, you know, beats Andrade, loses to Rodriguez, um, both strikers. And then as far as Dern, she, she beats Dern, but she gets taken down a couple times, controlled for 10 minutes, put in some bad spots. I think Jan has a hole in her game, and I think that hole is going to be exploited. I think for Zhang Weili to lose this fight, she's going to have to come in here with one of the most ridiculous game plans we've we've ever seen. I think Zhang is able to get this fight down to the mat, and, and when she does, she should be able to, to smash in this fight. So I like uh, Zhang Weili, and I like Zhang Weili by, by smash in this one. Weezy, what are your thoughts on this co-main event? Yeah, I mean, I agree with your take on this fight, but the only pushback that I would give is, you know, if you bet Wei Li Zhang and you and you lay that juice and she doesn't get takedowns, I don't think you're going to be happy. No. You know, I, I I really do think that this fight on the feet at distance is at least 50-50, if not in favor of Yan Zhao Nan. I mean, her striking is so clean, so efficient, she stays extremely busy. She's very accurate. She's very defensively responsible. Uh, she's flashed a little power, and she's shown durability. She has been knocked out once in her uh, once in her career, but that, you know that was ground and pound. Uh, so if Wei Li does not get takedowns, man, I think a a, a, a Yan Zhao Nan ticket's going to look really good in retrospect, whether or not you win. You know. I think that if if she doesn't get takedowns, that's going to go to decision for five rounds, and 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 Jan, Jan is going to be very competitive, and it's going to be a very close fight. But Wei Li Zhang is just a nightmare on top, and if she does get this fight to the ground, and she's completed nineteen takedowns in ten fights on forty five attempts, so she's got above average takedown accuracy. She's attempting 5.43 takedowns per 15 minutes, which is 1.87 more than the division. She's done a pretty good job of stopping takedowns, stopping two-thirds of them. And she's winning about 75% of the control time positions in her fights, while Jan only wins about 27%. So that's the big difference here. Is Wei Li, as you can see right there, wins minutes in the grappling exchanges. She's a lot more active of a wrestler than her opponents are. Jan, not much of an offensive wrestler, and her opponents have, have tried to take her down. So I think that that is the clear path to victory here for Wei Li. She's fought the better brand of competition. She's beaten the better brand of competition. And when she gets her uh, opponents back to the mat and gets on top, she does serious damage and looks very good there. I, all I'm saying, Brady, is if Jan in this big cage uses good footwork, and and uh, lateral movement and is able to stop the takedown attempts of Wei Li Zhang. This is a close fight, and Yan's going to look very live at the number. I mean, yeah, that's uh, absolutely like if yeah if if Zhang Wei Li shoots no takedowns, this is a 50-50 fight in my opinion. And even if she shoots takedowns and doesn't get them, yeah, it's going to be 50-50. And sometimes it's those situations where you're stopping the takedowns, the judges will kind of reward that and if it's 50 50 in the striking but one fighter is o of 10 on takedowns and the other one's o of o they're going to probably give it to the one that was stopping the takedowns because they were you know visually that looks good to the judges so um i'm picking way lee here i think she gets the job done i think her ground game is next level and she's been featuring it lately but like i say man yan jan nan by decision at, at a fat number might be something that I sprinkle this week, knowing that there is a win condition for her uh, if she keeps this fight standing and, and lands more strikes at distance, which is a certain possibility. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, Mackenzie Dern took her down twice. Like, how does that, how do, how do you get taken down by Dern? Well, Dern's been fighting with a lot more pressure lately. 
And that wrestling game has gotten a little bit better. Um, and, and of course, we, you know, Mackenzie's a grappler first. She's going to need to get those takedowns. But guess what? Mackenzie Dern's a lot more dangerous on the ground than Wei Li Zhang is. And we even saw Yan be able to survive those bad positions against her, get back up, and win, win the minutes on the feet. Now, Wei Li's a better boxer than Mackenzie is. So that's something that has to be addressed when we make that comparison there. But yeah, man, I agree with you, Brady. You know, I mean, like Wei Li on the ground is going to win the minutes in the moment. So, uh, and Wei Li's fights take place uh, about 36% of the time in those ground control positions. So that could be enough for her to win enough minutes on the, on the ground in order to win a decision here or potentially even get a finish like Carla did when she got to dominant positions on the ground against Jan. Yep. Let's see what we got in the chat here. Uh, da, 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 da. Zhang is my favorite parlay piece. Not going to lie. I can see her getting bet down to minus 600 by weigh-ins. I mean, she has the path to look minus 600. That's for sure. But, I mean, I I think you might have missed the boat, Abdi. I mean, she's minus five. Like, the line got crushed overnight. Can't play WMA at minus 500 regardless of who's fighting. Don't don't disagree. Whaley said the distance in the Lemos fight was such a bad beat. Yeah, it was. Yeah. I, I bet the... Uh, the fight doesn't go to the decision there at like minus 120. It closed at like minus 250. And um, somehow, some way, that fight didn't finish. Um, team Alpha Male, uh, Jan. Yeah, Team Alpha Male. Jan's been training at Team Alpha Male. And yeah, Zhang Wei not a plus in my book. No, Jean Wei has been training with. Who's that? Oh, is that Marab? Yeah. They're, they, oh, they're... you got to love that. You got to <laughs> love that. They've been doing She's a lot of work together. Wow, that's that's great. She always gets like the best training partners. Like uh, she went to fight ready. Now she's with Marab. Oh, she took her. She took it. She took his back. Yeah, she, that yeah. was pretty acrobatic too, man. <laughs> that was. Yeah, we <laughs> need something else, man. She there's a reason why she's such a huge favorite here. She's looked phenomenal lately. Uh, Zhang's juice has cobra blood in it. What does that even mean? <laughs> oh my god! Oh, never mind. Um, I got her this morning for minus three hundred. Yeah, you, you beat some line movement there. Beat some line movement. Jan via KO. I kind of lean decision. She, Jan's a terrible finisher outside of uh, the Andrade fight. I think that Andrade fight was her only finish, right? Yes, yeah, the only one in the UFC level. Uh, she's one and zero, oh or she's she's got one UFC KO, but seven and oh, and one to the decision in the UFC. And Wei Li Zhang has only been finished once, and even that one. You know, against Rose, I mean, she got dropped by that head kick and uh, the ref stepped in. But I, I think she could have come back from that probably. Jan by decisions, plus 450 on DraftKings and the money lines plus 380. Yeah, that's not great, man. I, I love, I, you know, at that price, you might as well just bet the money line, you know, because you never know what might happen. But yeah, uh, yeah, I, I think Whaley gets the job done here. But but there's there's a path for Jan. Yep, certainly is. All right, uh, let's move on now to this main event. Uh, if you guys have not already, be sure to smash the like button. I think we probably set a record tonight, 220. That seems like a, a lot of people. So appreciate you all hanging out here on a Sunday. We have the main event, light heavyweight championship on the line. Alex Pereira going against Jamal Hill. We got Alex Pereira, 36 years old, six foot four with a 79 inch reach. Jamal Hill, 32 years old, six foot four with a 79 inch reach. Jamal Hill, four years younger, same height. And same reach. Uh, we got Alex Pereira. His four and one. His last five fights: a knockout win against Sean Strickland, knockout win against Israel Adesanya, knockout loss against Adesanya, a decision win against Jan Blahovich, and then a knockout win against Yuri Prohashka. As far as Jamal Hill, a uh, four and one. His last five fights: that uh, knockout loss against Paul Craig, a knockout win against Jimmy Crew, Johnny Walker, Tiago Santos, and a decision win against Glover Teixeira. So for me, this was like the hardest fight for me to pick, man, because initially I'm like liking Pereira and then I go and watch Jamal Hill I'm like man I the striking is a lot better than I remembered um and then it's like I was going through Jamal Hill's record and it's like who's the best striker he's he's fought he's just you know he's he's took on Eclitz and Abreu OSP Darko Stosic um you know Johnny Walker has no chin Jimmy Crute's not a striker Paul Craig's not a striker Tiago Santos is is kind of washed and Glover Teixeira is like 42 so it's like this is gonna be the best striker Jamal Hill's fought, and it's it's you know by a mile, but I don't know. And then the, the whole thing with Jamal Hill's coming off of a you know gruesome injury, a surgery, 
Is he coming back too too early? Um, has he has he taken enough time to recover? It's just a fight. I, I just might. I know it's the main event, but I just might want to stay away from with all the the question marks. But Weezy, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this one. Yeah, I mean, a year and three month layoff here for Jamal Hill coming off a torn Achilles tendon, which is mm. just a nasty, nasty injury uh, to sustain. You know, I mean, for a for a great athlete like Hill, you know, this is something that you really have to wonder how he comes back from this because that's just it's a bad injury man and he's taking a good amount of time off here you know it's it's a year and three months for an achilles you can feel pretty confident that you know an athlete the level of jamal hill is going to be able to come back from that and perform at a high level again um and and you know and jamal is great dude i mean like this guy throws so much volume brady to be landing seven significant strikes per minute um, at in the 205-pound division is phenomenal. To flash the kind of power that Jamal Hill has flashed. 7-1 to the KO as a professional. 4-1 to the KO in the UFC. 67% finish rate by KO at the UFC level. This kid's, this kid's phenomenal. And he's also 5-0 in his decisions in his career. And that's because... Jamal keeps fights standing, and he throws a ton of volume on the feet. So he's a great minute winner. He flashes power and can win moments. This isn't the best matchup for him, though, because he's facing a guy in Pereira who has one-punch knockout power, the kind of guy who can beat up your lead leg. Alex Pereira can absolutely do that. A guy who can set up that big left hook and if it lands once, you know, that left hook of his is one of the most dangerous weapons in all of combat sports. There are very few people who have that kind of transcendental power that Alex Pereira has. That, that left hook, if it lands, there could be a prayer circle above you as you lie lifeless on the canvas when people see that thing land. I'll never forget Thomas Powell. Poor, poor Thomas Powell in LFA who was literally left sleeping for at least two full minutes after Alex landed a left hook that didn't even look like it landed that clean. <laughs> I mean, this guy, all it takes is one. And we've seen him go out there and just flatline minute winners like Sean Strickland. You know, um, he beats Yuri Prochaska by knockout, a guy one that's one of the most durable guys to ever walk into the cage, you know? Um, so this is an interesting one, man. Pereira's kickboxing pedigree is, is phenomenal. And we know he has power, but he's also winning minutes. And that's what makes him so scary. Because both these guys have pretty shitty defense. 52% at distance for Hill. 52% at distance for Pereira. But Pereira is so accurate at 59%. He's got such great low leg kicks that can really um, affect his opponent. Now, these are this is going to be an orthodox versus southpaw matchup. So, you know, I don't know how many inside leg kicks Pereira is going to throw, but he probably is going to throw a lot. He's probably very comfortable throwing that technique against opposite stance fighters. Um, and Jamal, we have to worry about the layoff. Is he going to be a hundred percent here? Um, man, it's a fascinating fight and. We know that our guy Clint uh, Brady might have gotten himself in a little bit deep. He, he put out a tweet like three weeks ago saying, for every like that this tweet gets, I'm going to bet a dollar on, on uh, Jamal Hill's money line. That tweet has gotten well over a couple of thousand likes now, I think. And Clint's got a lot of money that's going to be on Jamal Hill this week. So I'm rooting for our guy, Clint, you know, one of the best guys in the business. Um, but man, this is a tough matchup for Jamal here against the, you know what I mean? Like we could just take that whole third column of the spreadsheet and just throw it out because there will be no grappling in this fight. It's whoever gets the job done on the feet. That's going to win here. And it's the volume of Jamal Hill versus that power and precision of Alex Pereira. I mean, we've seen Alex get flatlined, and Jamal, I mean, Alex can flatline anybody if he lands that left hook. So I, I see somebody getting served here, man. I don't think this one's going to see the scorecards. But then again, 
kind of feel like the bookies are probably on the same page with that one. Yeah, pro- probably. We'll we'll check the uh, totals in a second. There's no way the under one and a half is minus 145. Is that true? I see plus 115. Let me look okay. here on. Uh, yeah, it's, it's plus 115. Plus 115 for the under one and a half. Wow. I kind of like that over one and a half at minus 145, man. Same. It opened up minus 115. I, I like the over two. Like a, like yeah. a decent amount. A decent amount. Yeah, I mean, like these guys are both obviously very powerful and very talented, and neither one of them has great distance striking defense, but you know they're both very capable. So I think that you know if if a knockout does come, it's probably going to come a, a little bit later in this fight. The durability is the thing. Um, yeah, I mean Jamal Hill has shown just incredible durability, whereas Alex Pereira's his durability has been looking a little iffy. It's a little iffy. Um, oh boy. He says, uh, Wakos, hopefully you pronounced that right. Uh, Wheezy Brady, I've been yelling from the rooftops for anybody willing to listen. I need help, please. I bet Walter Walker. Yes, that's not a typo. Got uh, laid off my job because the word spread to my job. And I was supposed to operate today and admin canceled the operation and said I have my privileges blocked to the operating room because I chose Walter Walker. First Ashkabov and now this. Yeah, and Ashkabov, what a, what a, fuckhead that guy is right i mean like remember what he got caught torturing some guy in 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 thailand and and, i mean it was like kind of caught red-handed and put in jail but yet he gets another ufc fight and then out of competition pisses hot for anabolic steroids and is handed a two-year suspension they just cut some 20 year old kid from the roster for biting somebody and this piece of shit ashkabov is out there literally trying to torture people in their own homes and is cheating. And he had a fraudulent 23-0 and record prior to being in the UFC, fighting a bunch of fucking cans. And this guy is still on the roster. Still on the roster. So after this two years, are we going to let Hussein Ashkabov, this fucking maniac, back on the roster to, to get in that cage? What the hell is going on here? I don't know, man. Um, <laughs> yeah, he, they they did give him another fight. So he was supposed to fight. Okay, this is a on tapology. <laughs> it says Daniel Pineda, and it says Ashkabov removed after being arrested. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah. so he was arrested for 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 kidnapping a dude and torturing him. Then the UFC said. Well, it sounded like you're sorry, Hussein. And now we're going to give you another fight. And that fight, he was supposed to fight, um, I forget who, but yeah, they, they got him with the... And like even USADA's gone. And this brain-dead fuck still, got, still managed to get caught. He's the first one to get caught. Weezy, you better be careful what you say about him. He might torture you. <laughs> yeah, dude. If he gets out of prison first, maybe he will, dude. And, and, and I don't know if a guy from Chechnya is getting a visa to come to the United States. And if he does, what the hell is wrong with our government? So I'm not worried about him. Okay. You know, there, there he's a fucking fraud and he only weighs 135 pounds. Dude, I've taken shits bigger than that, man. So fuck him. Hill in two. Uh, we haven't seen Hill rocked. Uh, we, we've seen Alex Ice by 185. Right? Yeah, but I mean... Who's the best striker that Hills fought? Is it 40-year-old Wash Tiago Santos? Is it 43-year-old Glover Teixeira? Or is it Chinny Johnny Walker? Which which one? Yeah, I mean, it's all three of those guys are good strikers, if we're yeah. being fair. I mean, Walker's super dangerous at range. Glover Teixeira is a great boxer. A lot of knockouts on his career. So, um, yeah, I mean, all those guys are really good strikers. But Alex Pajera has been you know, at the top level of a sport that doesn't even allow grappling, that's all striking. And, you know, so it's pretty clear that that Pereira's got the better pedigree in the in the kickboxing sport overall. But, man, Jamal Hill, Jamal Hill's a stud. Yeah, he is. A couple of Hill takedowns wouldn't surprise me. It would surprise me. Um, he just has zero shoot. takedown attempts in eight UFC fights. So it would surprise me. But that's what you should be doing. If you're a mixed martial artist, 
at this level, Jamal should have some wrestling in his back pocket. And if there's a goddamn time to try it, it's in this fight. Uh, Ted saw Alex dropped in training shots to not look hard. I think that was a fake video. That was a fake video, I think. Uh, Walter Walker is not good at all. No, he's he's not. Uh, let Weezy cook. Yeah, Weezy definitely cooked there. Not Just an Oscar like Ball fan. <laughs> no. Um. Okay. Da, da, da. How would you line this fight if you knew Hill would actually grapple? Um, but Same yeah, but, and then and then it'd be like, could he do it for twenty five minutes? I don't know. I don't. Yeah, think. I mean, it, it, Hill's fought for five rounds before on the regional scene. He did do it and actually looked pretty good. His cardio is great. Yeah, it is. That's one thing about Hill, man. That dude's got cardio for days for for a two hundred five er, and it shows with the volume that he throws on the feet. Absolutely. All right, Weezy, I think we we did it there. <laughs> and Weezy taking 135 pounds. Yeah, there you go. But uh, yeah, we did a lot it. of Italian food <laughs> over this last week, dude. <laughs> That'll do it. That'll certainly do it. But Weezy, we did it. We went through all 13 fights. Any final thoughts on the card? And then also your plans for this week for some content. I think, uh, well, I have some, some guest appearances. I think you have some guest appearances. Got a lot going on for UFC 300. Yeah, this is this is one of the best cards of the year. So obviously, you know, now I'm back from vacation. I'm I'm jumping into that pool neck deep. I'm gonna have a lot of action on this card. Uh, just a tip with Uncle Wheezy Tuesday night, ten o'clock Central Time. I'll break down all of these fights from a stats and tape study perspective. I'll give you uh, an underdog pick of the week. Finish with Uncle Wheezy's ass shaving of the week. Uh, Wednesday, right here on uh, Pub Sports Radio, Brady. We're gonna do the DFS show. With you, me, Gordo, and Monk, we always got great DFS advice on that show with four of the best in the game to do it right now. And then after that show, I'm going to be doing probability because it's UFC 300. So, Brady, if you've got time on Wednesday night, I'd love you to join me so that we could take a look at all the time props, all the over-under bets, as well as what these fighters' win conditions are and how those prop bets for KO, submission, decision, way against the wind conditions for both fighters. Try to find some plus EV spots to sprinkle uh, on these fights so that we can all stack cash tickets like flapjacks on the biggest card of the year, UFC 300. So definitely a lot more work to do this week. But job bless each and every one of you guys. And thank you for over 200 live viewers here on Pub Sports Radio. We appreciate each and every one of you. Yes, we do. And uh, get some help, Gary Copeland. I agree. You need, you need some serious help. Some serious help. But and Copeland would have stopped this show 45 minutes ago. Yeah, he would have. He would have for sure. Um, but yes, yeah, so yeah, a lot going on. Um, I got my full card breakdown out today. Going to be doing some. I didn't get that. Could you try again? Shut the hell up, Siri. <laughs> um, Siri just. Okay. Um, so anyway, series caught me off guard. So I'm so tomorrow I'm gonna be getting out maybe like a main event prediction, co-main event prediction, something like that. And then Tuesday I'm going on with Couch Warrior. I don't know the exact time. You said he goes live at like like eight, eight or nine. Around I think there. so. Usually on Tuesdays, uh yeah. All right, and then uh Wednesday, the DFS show, like I said, probability, and then Thursday, me, you, and Lou are all doing a show on MMA engine, props to consider, and then maybe bet. And then Friday, final thoughts, and then Saturday, best bet. So a ton of content, which it's going to be all worth it for this card. And then we also have a week off um, yeah. after this card as well, which is going to be well needed. And yes, I do I do still have some lingering issues from, from my sickness, that's for sure. All right, guys. Best of luck, everybody, for UFC 300. Like on your way out. Subscribe, and we'll talk to you guys very soon. See you later.